Welcome everyone to the first webinar in our pre-trail webinar series for 2024. Um, we're going to have a series of webinars again this year. Um, the next one is going to be next week, which is a women's webinar. Uh, super well attended last year, hosted by several women that have all hiked. Most of them have through hiked the GDT and other um, through hikes around the world. So they have a lot of a lot of knowledge around what it takes, tips, tricks, all that jazz. Um, we're also going to be having a natural history webinar, probably towards the end of February, um, as well as a risk management webinar. Um, we did one last year, and a lot of people wanted us to do another one this year. So this year, we're going to do it around weather, particularly lightning, um, and also around wildlife. Um, the Great Divide Trail has a lot of wildlife that you might not see in other parts of the world. So uh, I figured that'd be a good one for us to have to kind of help people learn about what it's like hiking in the Canadian Rockies. For um, questions tonight, I will try to answer every single question people have. Um, if you could please use the Q&A feature at the bottom um, rather than the chat function. The Q&A feature lets me see a question and then I can mark it as answered just so I'm, when I'm going through, I can make sure everybody's question is answered. Um, I will be using the chat feature to post some links just uh, to kind of loop you into some new pages that we have on the Great Divide Trail Association website as of yesterday. Um, and if I don't have an answer to your question tonight, I will try to find it out as soon as possible. The latest that should be I'm Saturday would maybe be the latest. And um, any questions I don't have the answer to, I'll send um, the answers out um, to the email that everybody registered with. Okay. And perfect. So I think it's prudent that um, since we are talking about a trail that goes through um, a lot of land that was not traditionally ours, um, it's important that we do a land acknowledgement. So the Great Divide Trail Association is committed to reconciliation, which starts by taking this and every opportunity to acknowledge our honor and privilege to live, work, and play within the Treaty 7 territory. We honor and acknowledge that the GDT passes through traditional indigenous territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony and Nakoda, the Sutina, Cree, Shwetmik, Lately Tene, Tanaha, Snikes, and Metis Nations. The Great Divide Trail Association would like to invite you to advocate for what you love and preserve nature for future generations to enjoy while educating yourself and others on indigenous history and perspectives. And Austin, just quick, uh, are we uh, recording the session? Yeah, I just hit record just a second ago. I will double check though. Yep, we are good for recording. Um, just a bit about me, um, so you know who's presenting to you tonight. Um, my name is Austin Hager. I'm a GDT through hiker in 2021, which was the year of the heat wave. Um, that same year, I was a Trek blogger for my trip, so if you're interested in reading about it, you can go and read my blogs from there. Um, that September, I joined the Great Divide Trail Association Board of Directors. Um, I'm still on the Board of Directors. Um, a few months ago, I was elected as Vice President. I'm the Chair of the Outreach Committee, and I'm currently in school to be a nurse. If anybody has wants to reach out or anything, here's my email. Feel free to shoot it over. Kelly is also going to be on the call. He's helping us. He'll be walking you through the Parks Canada Reservation System, and I have a bit of an introduction for him later. So just a bit of an overview on the Great Divide Trail Association, who we are. We are a volunteer organization. We're nonprofit. Um, we're the only organization that uh, kind of is working towards the advocacy of uh, maintaining and creating national recognitions for the Great Divide Trail. Um, we do a ton of volunteering, um, speaking to a lot of other trail organizations. I'm really proud to see how much the Great Divide Trail Association does with boots on the ground. Um, just in this past summer, we logged over 6,000 hours um, across 153 volunteers on numerous trail building trips. Um, we built a lot of new trail. We put in a lot of new signs. This year, we removed a ton of deadfall. There was some spots that avalanches have swept through and left tons of just debris that you had to cross. Um, we removed all of that. We installed a new bridge in section B. And uh, this past summer, we also spent quite a bit of time searching out spots to reroute the trail to avoid some of the, there isn't a lot of 
um, kind of dirt road walking, but there is a bit and we're trying to get the trail completely off of all multi-use trails. So it's 100% designated hiker and equestrian uh, trail. If anybody would like to become a member, there is, that would be great. I'm going to post it below here in the chat. Membership is super important for us. That's how we basically uh, get grants. It's how we, um, when we go to conferences, it just buys us a lot more validity when we say, hey, we have all these people that are backing us and all these people that want to help and protect the trail. And as part of that, there's some awesome membership benefits that are continuing to grow every single year. So here are some of the companies that uh, we have membership benefits to. If you are planning a through hike, becoming a member easily pays itself off. Um, some of the big things here, like if you're in the market for a quilt, Gear Trade, I believe, is one of the only companies in Canada that can get enlightened equipment. They have Z Packs, Hyperlight. Um, you can get discounts on Durston gear. Dan Durston's a huge supporter of the Great Divide Trail. Um, regarding resupply, I'll talk about this a bit later on the specific sections, but uh, for the resupply at the end of section B, the start of section C, there's a pretty big discount if you're a GDT member, um, and also if you're getting a uh, resupply in section G at Blueberry Lake. Um, and new for this year, there's also a shuttle from Calgary Airport to Waterton Park to start the trail, and there's also a discount for that shuttle as well. One new thing at the GDTA, we have official maps printed as of right now. Um, it's with the latest um, the latest map that just got updated here in the winter. Um, they're available on GearTrade at geartrade.ca. Um, they are either paper or you can get them in kind of the, the um, Tyvek-y waterproof material. Um, they just came out two days ago. You can buy, a, if you buy the full map set, you get quite a discount or you can just buy a section by section. The same data is available on the GDTA site. Um, I will post the link for the maps here at Gear Trade. Um, and then regarding the actual maps, I will show um, that link here in a minute. Okay, so a bit of an overview if people are not fully aware about the Great Divide Trail. So almost everybody goes northbound on it. The southern terminus is at Waterton Lakes National Park, and the northern terminus is Kakwa Lake Provincial Park. Um, the average duration for a full through hike is 50 to 55 days. Um, distance, it's always kind of fluctuating. The latest data we actually have, I think it's about 1,106 kilometers. Um, it's really hard to measure specifically when it's that long, but uh, the latest info I got is that it's a little bit shorter with uh, some rerouting that we've done. It's broken up into seven sections and people are typically doing it with five or six resupplies. And if you've used our website before, um, it will look a little bit different now. We just redid it. I think it's much better for um, planning out a trip. Now we've kind of created one dashboard, the go hiking page. Um, from there, you can look at each section. It'll show you how to resupply. It'll show you access points and how to get there. Um, in general, it's a lot more organized and uh, a little less daunting for somebody that maybe hasn't been on our uh, site before. Okay, going on to section A. Um, before I kind of get started about each section, there's just a bit of information I want to chat with people about. So I'm going to probably use the term zero a lot um, for people that haven't through hiked. Um, when I say zero, that just means a non-hiking day. Um, and then I will also be referring to a lot of um, things regarding maps. And if you are going to step foot on the GDT, I highly suggest you get the Far Out app. Um, it used to be called Gut Hook. Um, I ran into a few people in Banff when we were at the Banff Mountain Film Fest a few months ago, and they used um, the Gaia app. And they didn't load our specific trail in there because Gaia does show a GDT on there. Um, it's very out of date, um, and it takes a lot of straight lines when it's not a straight line. Um, also, with the nature of the GDT, is frequently changing, and Far Out is the most up-to-date. We updated it yesterday, um, actually this morning. So it's completely up-to-date. There are some sections that um, 
due to some weather and bridge washouts that are kind of up in the air right now. I'll talk about those later. And if you use the Far Out app, us as an organization, we can put comments in there real time. So when you go and you get Wi-Fi in between sections, you can know day of if we've updated it, if this alternate's available, um, highly suggest people do it. Um, also, if people use it, the, we do get a bit of money from uh, Far Out, which is great. This is the new page. So your question there. That's the new page. So if you go to the Great Divide Trail Association website, um, at the top, there will be a thing that says go hiking. And I just put the URL down there for you. All right. So Section A starts in Waterton Lakes National Park. It ends in Coleman, Alberta, which is in Crow's Nest on Highway 3. It's about 145 kilometers throughout the whole section. There's about 7,000 meters of elevation gain. Um, a couple, the two most prominent alternates are going to be the Rose Sage Pass alternate and Barnaby Ridge. Um, here's a bit of a map of it. And I just posted a couple, if you're looking for a shorter section hike, if you live kind of in Southern Alberta there, if you're looking for a shorter trip, those are a couple options from Acumena Pass Trailhead, the Sage Pass, and then you go back on the alt. Back. So that's a loop. Also, the um, if you start at Su Suicide Creek Trailhead, you can do a loop on La Coulette and Barnaby Ridge. Um, regarding the section, there is, um, particularly with the Rosage Pass alternate, there's not a lot of water there. Um, I've heard it's quite spectacular. The year I hiked the trail, it was super hot, um, well over 40 every day for through Section A, so that was not really an option. Um, and on Barnaby Ridge alternate, same thing, you're exposed for quite a while up there. So um, usually uh, in this section, it's more of a, you got to play by ear with the weather. Um, we had planned to do Barnaby Ridge, but because it was so hot, it was too far to go without water. So we decided to just take the uh, normal route, which is also spectacular. Um, on section A2, there are notes in Far Out. Um, they should be live in a couple days. But um, when you are on section A, it's important that you refill your water at Scarp or Jutland. Those are the two campsites before La Coulette. Um, that's definitely the hardest part on Section A. Uh, there's no water for quite a while. You're going up three peaks along a ridge. Um, most people will sleep at Scarp or Jutland, so then they can kind of tackle La Coulette Ridge first thing in the morning. Here's a bit of other info regarding Section A um, for permits. So if you're doing a Great Divide Trail hike, um, you will need a Parks Canada Discovery Pass. Um, you can get it for an individual, which is 75 bucks, or you can get it for a group. So this group can be three, four people, um, and then you can split it that way. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty common for people when they arrive in Waterton to spend a night at the townsite campground. Uh, it's kind of front, front country. It's basically just kind of a big field with some designated sites. Um, it's first come, first serve. Um, as of this year. Regarding Waterton backcountry sites, um, these are the sites here that are listed. Um, they go live on January 24th on the Parks Canada website. We'll kind of give you an overview on how to do that. Um, and then there's a bit of a, an anomaly. Um, it's most people, so it's pretty common, most people that will go to Waterton, stay at the town site campground. They'll go south and go to the, the monument and then go back up to the town site and spend the night. Um, and then kind of start the hike. And then it's pretty common. Most people's first night is going to be the Akamina Kishinina site. And that's a $5 cash on site. Some other things for Section A. Um, you will go through the Castle Mountain Ski Resort. They have a pub that's open Friday through Sunday. They're not open Canada Day, even if it's the weekend. We found that out the hard way. Um, once you finish Section A, uh, you can. most people are going to be resupplying in Coleman. Blairmore is a bit bigger town. It's down the road a bit, um, and they have a gear shop called Spry. There's um, a B&B &B called Country Encounters. They will hold a resupply package for you if you're a GDT hiker, uh, assuming that you stay there. You also get a discount if you are a GDT member. And when you're done, there's a brewery, the Pass Brewery. They uh, had a Great Divide Trail Association beer. Uh, I think it was a peach sour, a peach wit this past year. It was great. Um, does anybody have any questions about Section A before I kind of jump on to Section B regarding distances, itineraries? 
One thing I do want to mention is uh, if anybody's joining us coming from the States or hiking other trails, when uh, we kind of talk about tr the GDT being steep, that's at a grade of usually about 20 to 30 percent. Um, I know some other trails like in uh, Glacier National Park in Montana, I know the steepest trails I've been on there was about 10 percent. So uh, take distances uh look at them a bit differently. I know a lot of people are doing much shorter distances on the GDT just due to the nature of the trail being much steeper and, and not as perfectly maintained as some of the American trails. Do you carry a Parks Discovery Pass uh, in person? I took a picture of it um, and that seemed to be fine. Um, I think just take a picture of the front and a picture of the back and then that totally uh, that totally works. When should I start booking sites? The very second they are released. Um, the biggest issue will be in section C. Um, there's a few, that's really where you got to focus, um, going through Banff, Kootenai, Yoho parks. Um, but yeah, to give you an idea, when I booked my sites and most people, what they're doing is I had five devices all logged in. Um, that morning, because you got kind of go in like a, a lottery queue. So it's like you're in a waiting system. And then I had, is, and then the first device that could get logged on, that's where I started to book my sites. We'll talk more about the site specifically later, um, but you should have an itinerary fully planned out by the time uh, reservations go live and then jump onto this quickly as possible. I also later where we do have more contentious sites, I'll show you the order that I think you should book them uh, just because these are ones that aren't quite as, uh, it's harder to work around not having this site versus other ones you can kind of say, okay, well, I didn't get this. I can switch to this. Maybe one thing uh, I'll add is also, at least in Waterton, um, historically, Waterton has been a bit unique in how you obtain permits and you'd actually uh, call the permit office in uh, in Waterton. Uh, this year, they have switched to the, the, the Parks Canada standard a reservation system, as you can see on, on January 24th. So it'll be the same process now for booking uh, backcountry campsites in uh, Waterton Lakes. Yeah, good comment, Kelly. Also, Waterton, at least in my experience, has been one of the easier um, parks to get reservations. So they do they are released earlier than all the others, so you should definitely jump on it the day of. But uh, there's a few sites in Section C that are, as far as I know, the most popular sites in all of Parks Canada. There's one day that's around 29 km. Can you break that up? Um, 29 is very, I mean, for many people, it's very doable on the um, on the trail. If you want to ask me specifically where it is, I'm happy to, to give you a, a better idea. Um, if you want to just say where you're starting and where you're ending, I'll give you an idea on how hard that might be and if there's any alternatives for that. How much water do you suggest carrying for La Coulette Peak Day? Um, I had, so the year I hiked, it was very, very hot. Um, we started at 2 a.m. just because the high was well over 40 degrees, and I had two and a half liters. Um, I think if I had started at the time of a normal human of like 7 or 8 a.m., I think three liters is pretty good. Um, if you go and take Barnaby Ridge, um, everybody I know has gone to the lake. Oh, I'm spacing on the name. On the Far Out app, I can just look it up, actually. There's a lake off of Barnaby Ridge. Um, everybody I, I know has had to go lake. down there. Do you know, Kelly? Uh, Grizzly Lake, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, Grizzly Lake. Everybody I know has had to go there to grab water. Um, it's a few hundred meters elevation loss. Um, but yeah, most people, three liters is pretty good, assuming you're starting full um, at Scarp and then going. And then by the time you're done, there's uh, some creeks at the other end. How technical is the Barnaby Ridge Alt? Um, we've done a lot of good flagging in this past summer. We did some trail work out there. So we've created a bit more visible of a path. I know if you look on some of the YouTube videos that people have done it, they had a bad time on it. Uh, it's better now, but it's still, I've heard it's like, if you climb or scramble, it's really not that big of a deal, but coming from a bit of a hiking perspective, it's quite technical. I know most people, I mean, it's two hands on the wall, two hands below, and it's a couple down climb moves. Um, once you've done that, you're just on the ridge, but
but there is a section where it's kind of like you have to down climb a little bit. I'll try to find a picture, I'll make a note of that, of what it looks like to send people just so you can get a, a full idea. Because there is a picture that we took this past summer when we did um, work out there. Is June 15th too early of a start? Really hard to say. Um, this year in the Rockies, I think it's pretty obvious where we have a historically low snowpack. Um, so traditionally, I'd say June 15th is really on the edge. A lot can happen. I mean, we could get a ton of snow in April, May, June, July. But um, usually I'd say June 15th, I'd be pretty cautious. A couple people do it every year. Um, if this year turns out kind of, if we're on the same momentum for snowpack, um, I, we June 15th looks like it might be okay. Um, usually third to fourth week of June is kind of the earlier um, batch of hikers. Like um, the year I hiked, most people left between the 27th of June and the 2nd of July, and that was totally fine. Um, but it does look like the snow is not going to be, we don't have the same kind of snowpack this year. I'll also be, I'll send out a, um, an email that goes out after this webinar. I'll shoot everybody the email where you can monitor snowpack levels um, in BC and Alberta. Just going to make a note of that for myself. And uh, I clicked the button on the, uh, the the one to answer on the app that was mentioned. So this is the Far Out app, uh, F A R O U T. Uh, if you do a search on the App Store, you should be able to find it fairly quickly. And it offers uh, basically you have to the downloading the app is free, but then you need to kind of you know purchase different map packages, and it has everything from you know the Triple Crown in the U S. to the GDT to you know dozens and dozens of uh, of different trails if if you're interested. Perfect. Um, Lisa, section D dogs, I, I'm almost certain there's no problem with dogs on section D. Um, if I remember correctly, and I can find out for sure on dogs, it's actually on the website too. So I can just link it. Um, I think the only, um, rule with dogs comes in on section E at the Brazo loop. Um, one thing though, is there are, there's some water crossing. So depending on how big your dog is, you might need to carry your dog across, but um, usually that wouldn't be an issue. This will be uploaded to YouTube probably tomorrow evening. Um, how long would a section A hike, section hike take? So I'm just going to go back a slide. Oh, I forgot to have that in there. I would say usually about... Um, Seven days is pretty standard for on a through hike pace for section A. Um, people definitely do it faster and people definitely do it slower, but usually I'd say six to eight days would be a, a pretty standard section A. Uh, one thing, if, if folks do look on the website under uh, go hiking, there are some sample itineraries that are put together. One that's kind of like a, if you're a fast hiker, it's it's more kind of a collapsed itinerary. If you're a slow hiker, there's also kind of a slow itinerary and then an average one. So that'll give you kind of a, a good feel if you're trying to figure out, you know, you know, how many miles a day can I make? You know, where should I be looking to stay? Um, it'll give you a kind of a good, good place to start. Uh, will you be able to download slides? Yeah, I can. Um, in the email I send, I can't do it at the this very moment, but um, I can definitely send the slides out um, tomorrow. When I have answers to all these questions, I'll just link a, a Google Drive file to these slides because it's probably too big to, to email out, but I'll make it available. The process of exporting GPX from far out. Not too many ex people export from far out. I actually don't know if it's possible. Kelly might know, but um, far out's used on your phone um, and then it just uses the GPS off your phone. And then most people will just back that up with paper maps um, or um, some people that use a watch. Uh, you can download the, the KML off of our website and then upload that onto your watch. Yeah, that, that's the what I was going to suggest is, yeah, you can get the KML file from the, uh, the website. And from there, you can import it into whatever tool you want, Basecamp, 
you know, I, I've, I've even imported into uh, into Gaia on on my my phone as well. So if you want to use other tools, that would be the the source of truth. The only thing that I would suggest is that uh, you kind of leave it to the last, if you are going to do that, kind of leave it to as late as possible before you're leaving to to download the latest track because we we do update it, uh, you know, fairly um, um, frequently, especially in the spring when we get details on trail conditions, washouts, that sort of thing. Uh, but you'll want to make sure you get the, the latest and greatest uh, before you uh, import it. Um, someone doesn't know what their start date, they won't know what their starting date at, until May. Um, does that mean there's no chance? No, there's certainly a chance. Um, I spoke to someone actually in November that they didn't decide to hike the Great Divide Trail until the day they started. And they didn't make a single reservation until they showed up on the first day. And they managed to make it all happen all the way through. Um, also, we'll probably talk about it. There's a great um, website called Schnurp now, which talk, which will sh let you know when campsites are canceled and you can get like first dibs on them. Um, also, really, there's only section C is really the only hard spot to make it happen. Um, the very worst case scenario, I think, would be that you could do sections A, B, half of C, and then maybe hop off, uh, hitch a ride or arrange a ride up, and then you could do D, E, you could almost do without any problem F and G. So the, the hard part is really only about 100 to 150K of 1100k for reservations and even then um you can arrange your itinerary to a point where you can make some things work where it's first come first serve or you don't need a reservation and uh, I, I don't want your um not knowing your start date till may to dissuade you um bear activity in section a uh so waterton has a lot of bears um I saw, I've seen more bears there than most other sections. Uh, Jasper, the town of Jasper probably has more, but that's uh, that's the only place. Um, there are, there, the year I hiked, there were some bears that were kind of hanging around the campground. We scared it away. Um, I haven't heard of any bad interactions between a hiker and a bear um, for several years. Um, I'll talk about this specifically in our uh, risk management webinar that's coming up probably beginning of February. Um, but yeah, there's grizzly bears the whole, and black bears the entire way across the whole Great Divide Trail. Um, notes going live and far out. Yeah, so in the far out app, when you download it, um, there will be all these waypoints that'll be, it'll show like, oh, here's a spot to camp. And then when you click on it, there will be a little description of it, um, which is a description that the GDTA weaves. This is our description of the campsite. And then below that, there will be all these comments. So anybody that has the app and they can leave a comment and say, this was a great campsite. I loved it. Or holy cow, there were a ton of bugs at this campsite. It's worth going two more K to the next campsite. All these comments come up um, on there. And so for sections that might be getting some maintenance done, we're going to try to put some bridges in in the spring. It's a really easy way for us as an organization to leave a comment and say, hey, actually, that you can go on this alternate now. We just put this bridge in. Or, hey, we just brushed 6K of this trail. It's in great shape now. Or, or other people could say, hey, this spring, there was a, a bunch of trees that fell down. Um, this is going to be a bit longer of a day. Um, all these comments are on the app. Um, just make sure once you're in there, there's a little spot to say, uh, like, update or refresh your uh, um, refresh comments. And that'll give you the, the most up-to-date ones. There's some really good YouTube videos on how to use the Far Out app on YouTube um, with people that are much better at it than me, and they, they uh, can break it down really easily. And final question, is there an effort to create an overarching permit like the PCT? For sure, if there is. Um, that's one of the biggest things we're working on at the GDTA. Um, it's quite difficult right now to give you an idea. The Great Divide Trail is not nationally recognized or protected. So there are a lot of sections where we're going just through crown land where we aren't protected and industry could come in, for example, and then we would have to reroute the trail. Um, so I think it's going to be hard for us to get the permit before we're nationally recognized. Parks Canada also doesn't recognize the Great Divide Trail. They do help us out in a lot of different ways, but it's definitely not um, like it, uh, it's not protected or secured through Parks Canada. 
Um, but yeah, that would be wonderful if we could create a, a permit. And it's definitely on, it's definitely in everybody's minds and it's something that we are actively working towards. Yeah, oh, so and one, one, one of the kind of complicating factors is that there's a lot of different kind of land managers and jurisdictions along the GDT, which is uh, a bit different from the uh, the big scenic trails in the US where there's actually the uh, the National Scenic Trails Act in the US that kind of regulates and, and provides certain kind of authorities and management um, rules for the agencies that are responsible for the trail. Um, in Canada, it's, it's a bit more fragmented between the, the two provinces and uh, and the federal government, which makes it more complicated. But again, it is, you know, as Austin mentioned, it's a, it's a key priority that we're, um, um, that we're trying to uh, address and move forward in, in some way, shape or form. There's people in the waiting room. Let's see. Kelly, I don't see a wait, an active waiting room. Do you? So I'm just taking a quick look. Yeah, I don't see anyone in the waiting room. Normally in Zoom, you'll have a little uh, uh, under uh, participants. There'll be a little block if anyone's waiting. So. Mm -hmm. Just gonna double unless, check. Unless we've met, unless we've uh, hit some kind of a uh, capacity. We should. We have room for five hundred. Hmm. Yeah. I disabled a waiting room for this. If you want to ask them if they can leave and then try to re-enter, that'd be great. Oh, and one thing, sorry, I should have started with this. I just have a quick little poll here for everybody on the call. Five questions, they're pretty quick. Um, first one, just kind of curious where you are joining us from. really helps for when we we're going to go to trade shows or any kind of information where we're going to to direct it Okay, give people up five more seconds here. Awesome. Plans for the GDT this year. All right, lots of through hikers. Awesome. Okay. All right, hiking experience. Well, wow, really even mix between everybody. Love to see that almost half the people here are members. Thank you. And where'd you hear about the webinar? If anybody here is not part of the um, Great Divide Trail Hikers Facebook page, highly advise joining it. Um, it's lots of very experienced hikers, GDT hikers are on there. You can find answers to a lot of questions there. Okay, jumping on to section B. This is Window Mountain Lake. All right, so section B starts in Coleman, right where section A ends, um, and then it uh, ends in Peter Lohi Provincial Park. It's about 195 kilometers with about 7,900 meters of elevation gain. Um, pretty much right out of Coleman, this is where we built the new High Rock Trail, which avoided a very long roadwalk. Um, the trail is in spectacular condition. Um, it's a it's a great, great new trail. Um, you can also kind of do it as a section hike. It's on our website under the Go Hiking page. Um, and one of the best parts about section B is that there's no reservations required. Here are kind of the permitting things for section B. Um, so camping in kind of the, the random areas east of the Rockies, uh, you will need a Alberta public lands camping pass. Um, you can buy it online. Um, 
At the very end of section B, uh, you'll be in Elk, Elk Lakes Provincial Park. Not many people stay here because you're so close to finishing the section, but it's a beautiful spot and it's, uh, it's five bucks. You can book it online or pay cash in person. And then at the end of B, when you're resupplying or if that's where you're ending, you'll be at um, Bolton Creek. Um, that is in Peter Lohe Provincial Park. And to book that, it's uh, just a rolling window of 90 days in advance. Um, some people have resupplied at Highwood House. I haven't sp spoke with anybody that's done that. Almost everybody does Section B in one push. Um, and then almost everybody that I know has used uh, the resupply from Nicole Sharp. Um, her information is on the, the Go Hiking page for resupplying. Um, again, huge discount um, for GDTA members. Um, so she will drive you a resupply box out to Bolton Creek. It's about 45 minutes from her house. So take that in mind on why there is a fee for it. Um, she's a huge supporter of the trail. Anyway, we have a bear locker there with a combo code. So she'll kind of put it in the locker and text you the code. Um, usually she's chatting with people with an inReach. Um, so if you're doing it through hike, I highly suggest having some kind of satellite communicator. Um, the fee for the resupply, it's 50 bucks if you aren't a member or 35 if you are. Um, so highly advise doing that. You can resupply at Bolton Creek just in the store there. There's a small camp store. If you do that though, I would really suggest going into Banff to do another resupply. Um, most people are, don't go to Banff just because the craziness of Banff and it's quite expensive and it can kind of bring you back into town and off trail and it'll add a couple days to your itinerary, um, and several dollars. Um, so most people do a resupply with Nicole, um, a box. I've never heard of anybody having too big of a box. Um, you probably don't want to carry that much anyway. Um, and then you can kind of push all the way to the end of, of section B, um, if you do, most people, if you do break it up, so Banff is three or four days in, and that kind of splits the section in half, but it does add a, it adds a couple days just for the, the hassle of going down into town, staying in town, doing your stuff. It's not really the kind of town where you can get all the way into Banff and then back on trail in one day. That'd be, that'd be pretty hard. Um, there's no service, service at Bolton Creek Campground. Um, just in general, along the GDT, there's very few spots with service. There's really only a handful of spots where you'll have cell service. Um, but yeah, so if you are taking a zero here, just know you won't have any service. Um, and so you'll mostly just be hanging out and charging stuff up. One tip I would have is when I went when I went through, we just kind of did a, a first come first serve tenting only site. Um, it's at the top of a hill, which was not what I wanted to do on my day off is just walk up and down this hill, going to the store and back to the tent site. Um, so I would highly suggest getting a powered site, even if you're going to be closer to some RVs, just being able to charge your stuff at your site would be great. Cause I was just kind of sitting outside this store for like six hours, charging my battery bank, my watch, my phone, um, all day when instead I could have been hanging out at the lake or hanging out at the campsite, but instead I was just kind of sitting on a sidewalk next to a store all day. So it's worth paying the extra 15, 20 bucks for a powered site. Does anybody have any questions about section B? Let's see, we got a few. And if you look at like the, the Bolton store, it's mostly uh, designed for like front country camping and kind of serving the, uh, the campsites there. So, you know, if you're looking for like, you know, food that's going to last, I mean, I, I hope you like ramen because that's, you know, probably the, the, the main um, kind of, uh, you know, food that you're, you're going to be able to take. Otherwise, if you like, if you like bacon and you like, uh, um, you know, like hungry man meals, uh, they have a nice, really good ice cream place there. So you can definitely get ice cream and a, and, and a pizza and chocolate bar, but it is pretty hard to like properly resupply there. If you're, uh, you know, like if you need another six or seven days of, of food to keep going. Mm hmm yeah, and one thing I will say about section B, um, it, it's, it seems in the beginning, it seems pretty easy, but it actually has the second most elevation gain for any section. So, um, just to kind of keep that in mind, I know some, uh, because it doesn't go through some of the big parks, I, I think it kind of has this, uh, tendency that people think it's easier, but it's not necessarily easier. The trail's in good shape for most of it, but, uh, it's still quite stout. Someone's planning a horseback trip on the GDT, but it looks like Jasper doesn't allow horses on some of the trails. Is it still possible to go through? 
Personally, I don't know anybody that's done a full horse trip of the GDT. Um, I'm trying to think on where that would be an issue. Kelly, do you know anywhere in particular that um, horses would be a yeah, problem? I think like there, like if you look at like ice or not, it's like skyline. And I think some of those areas don't uh, don't permit uh, horses. I believe, I'm trying to remember, because I have seen an itinerary that someone did put together that was um, more specifically equestrian focused. I'm trying to remember if it, if it was on the website somewhere or, um, but I have seen one. Um, maybe we can take an action to try to, to track that down and, and, and send it out. For sure. Yeah, I'll definitely find that in the next couple of days. I think um, Robert, who was on outreach before, uh, may have had that itinerary. Yeah. Oh, the, the other place I can think of that doesn't allow horses would be a white goat uh, wilderness area. That uh, That's another place that, that doesn't permit. And that's on section uh, first part of section E. The southern part, section E. Yeah. Who are the preferred mobile phone providers in Canada? Um, regarding the Great Divide Trail, none of them are any better or worse as far as I know. Um, if you're coming just for a couple a couple months, um, I mean, really, we only have a few um, cell phone providers in Canada, and then they all kind of have their own, they each have their own like cheaper brands. So Bell, Rogers, and TELUS are the three big ones. And then there's, um, they each kind of have like a less expensive brand. So Kudo, Fido, and there's probably another one. Um, but if you're just coming for a, a GDT hike, I would probably just get whatever's cheapest because um, there's really only service at the beginning of section A, um, the end of section C, and the end of section E. Those are really the only spots um, you're going to have service on the trail. Pretty much anywhere on trail, you're not going to have service. Um, food carries are around a week. Yeah, pretty much. Um, most food carries are six to eight days on an average itinerary. Section D is a little bit shorter, so that's three or four days. Um, and then section F and G, because most people are doing that all together. Um, on an average itinerary, that's about 11 or 12 days, which is an excellent challenge for the end. Um, but now that we have a resupply at Blueberry Lake, you can break that up almost right in the middle. And I'll talk about that later. If Bolton has RV sites that allow tents too. Um... Yeah, Bolton, they don't, they don't distinguish. So like they, if you want to set up a, a tent in an RV spot uh, or, or vice, well, by, I mean, they, they do have a couple of walk-ins where you can only set up a tent, but um, any of the other sites, if you want to, like the powered sites, and some of them have water and, and full service, um, you know, if, if you want to, they, they do charge a bit more for the full service sites, but if you want to set up a tent, there there's no concern. The, the only place I'm aware of that has a bit more of a, a hard restriction is uh, Lake Louise, mm -hmm. where they actually have like tent sites and RV sites, and the, the tent sites are actually inside a uh, electrified fence to to keep the bears out. So, but that's the the only place on the trail I'm where there's a um, a rule about uh, you know tenting in in certain areas. Section B compared to section A regarding beauty, um, I find the the first half of section A is quite spectacular, and then the first half the first half of section B is really great. Um, towards the north end of B you're, I mean, it's, it's all really nice. It, it's, uh, it's interesting how much the topography changes even through a couple, like a hundred kilometers, because it can look quite different. Um, Waterton, you're really prairies straight up to mountains, right where they start versus section B, you're kind of in the mountains a little bit more. Um, either way, that's the one section I think I'd like to go redo. I had a lot of thunderstorms in that section, but yeah, I don't think there's really a, a bad section. Um, section D used to be the kind of the ugly duckling of the trail, but it's kind of been redone with some alternates and it's uh, it's really great now. And there's a horse route on the GDTA website. Perfect, I'll find that link and send it out to everybody. All right, moving on to section C. So section C is definitely gonna be the spot where reservations are the most important. Okay. So section C um, starts in Bolton Creek at Peter Lohe Provincial Park and ends at Field BC. 
Um, it ends kind of right on Trans Canada Highway. So this is a section most people are going to, to hitch rather than walk. The shoulder's pretty narrow there. And most people from here are either going to be heading into Golden or Lake Louise for a resupply. It's uh, right around 200K, um, has over 8,000 meters of gain. This is the, the most amount of gain for any section on the Great Divide Trail. Um, but it has the best quality trail along the whole way because you're going through um, Banff, Hootenay, Yoho, Lake Louise Parks. Um, and for alternates, uh, Northover Ridge is an alternate. This is probably my favorite spot on the entire Great Divide Trail is Northover Ridge. Um, I did it on my GDT hike, and then I did it again last summer with a friend. Um, it also makes for a great loop. If you're starting at uh, Peter Lougheed Park, you can do kind of this the Northover um, loop where you go up Northover and then back down on the actual Great Divide Trail. Um, I will say it's quite high. You're at about 2,700 meters. Um, for people coming from the Rockies in the States, that doesn't sound very high, but um, the the prominence of the Canadian Rockies is quite high where towns are low, but the, the peaks are quite high. Um, with Northover Ridge, um, there aren't reservations. There's a spot where you kind of can camp on these beautiful alpine lakes just because you cross into BC where wild camping is allowed. I'll chat about that here in a minute. Um, but Northover should definitely not be attempted if the weather is looking like there might be storms. You're really high. Um, some people call it a knife edge um, compared to coming from like a scrambling or climbing background. It's definitely not a knife edge, um, but it can be quite narrow. There's a section where it's maybe about 10 feet long where the path is maybe two feet wide and uh, don't fall. Uh, you might, you're not, you're not going to be a good shape if you fall in that, that short little section. Other than that, you're kind of walking along a ridge that's a bit wider, but um, there's a lot of fear mongering around Northover Ridge. Um, I'll try to find a particular picture um, of the skinny spot to give people an idea. I should have put that on here, um, but it's very doable. It's just not a spot you want to trip. Um, I will say the normal path of the Great Divide Trail through that section is also great because um, I hadn't done it till this past year because I did north over on my original hike. The, the, the normal route is absolutely remarkable as well. So this is kind of when the reservations really kind of uh, become feisty. Um, to give you an idea, here's all the parks that you kind of pass through. Um, Peter Lougheed, Height of the Rockies, Banff, Assiniboine, Kootenai, and Yoho. Um, here's all the release dates for them. Basically, uh, you can get a couple nights in before these reservations are really hard to get. Right out of Peter Lougheed Park, so right at the beginning of the section, if you're traveling northbound, um, these uh, Forks, Three Isle, Turbine Canyon, those spots are a lot easier to get. Um, uh, they're only 90 day rolling, so you won't be booking those um, until uh, like the spring. Then you kind of get into BC a little bit um, in the height of the Rockies Provincial Park. There's no reservations there. Um, kind of the, the tough spots start to come along when you're in Banff and Assiniboine and Kootenai Park. So I kind of have here on the right side the priorities on how you should be booking them and some alternatives. So um, we'll kind of go over this later with the reservations, but there's some pretty big sections. If you don't get a reservation, there's some big chunks that you're going to have to book. So I think before, so I would say actually the most important is probably ball pass. If you don't get ball pass, you're going to be in for a really, really big day. Um, that's right before you enter the rock wall trail, um, which is a really, really famous multi-day backpacking trip um, through Kootenai National Park. You, you kind of are in Ball Pass, that's in Banff, and then you cross the highway and then you're in Kootenai National Park. Um, and that's where Flow Lake is. Um, Flow Lake, there are some alternatives to Flow Lake. Um, if you wanna do it, I would say that's the first site you should book. Um, otherwise, most through hikers are gonna be moving on um, to Numa, which is the next site or you can keep going to Tumbling Creek. And then there's also Wolverine Pass, which is on the Rockwall Trail, which um, doesn't have an established site, but Wolverine Pass is just outside the park boundary. It's very much still on the trail by the looks of it. You're just kind of, it's a bit of a uh, little, um, 
it's jurisdiction about, thing. Three, about 300 meters off the trail you yeah kind of walk walk across the uh you know walk off the trail and, and out of the park and uh into the pass and i mean it's it's uh pretty rustic so yeah, you're not going to have outhouses and uh, uh food lockers there but um in a pinch if you can't get a permit kind of along this way it's uh it's definitely a, a good place to fit to feel in and mm -hmm. yeah I, i'd reiterate just like how important you know ball pass is it's a small campground there's only five spots there um so it's you know it's it's not i'd say like super super popular but just because it's small it does to tend to get fit, to fill up pretty quick um and even if you get ball pass and, and flow lake it's it's a 20 kilometer day and out of ball pass i mean it's it's about a thousand meters of elevation between getting up to ball pass then you're all the way back down to the highway and then it's another 800 meters elevation up to flow lake so mm -hmm. you know even even if you get both of those sites it's a long day um if if you miss those sites then it just becomes an even longer day um i know some people in order you know who've who haven't had luck they've you know kind of you know hiked down to the highway and then hitched you know, into, you know, you know, into field or, or down the highway, because there are some front country campsites that you can kind of stay there, and then hitch back to try to get back on trail. Um, others just kind of, you know, if if you're through hiking, you've already, you know, come, done quite a lot of miles, and you've got some pretty good uh, legs. And it's like, yeah, you, you just might have to to buckle down and have a 35 40k day um, to, to get through that. Yeah, also, so this is really the section that like, if you don't know your dates until May, when you're going to be starting, there's really just this small chunk that you may, you might miss out on, um, just because it's such a popular spot for weekend hikers. Um, and also, for example, say you get ball pass, or if you can't get ball pass, you could get Egypt Lake. Um, another option is you can go from there and then just hike to the highway. And then the Rockwall Trail um, goes parallel with the highway. So you can even get a hitch up the road of probably seven kilometers and then enter at Tumbling Creek, which is a, a much bigger campground on the Rockwall Trail. You'll miss a little chunk of it, but you're really only going to miss maybe 25 kilometers of trail. Um, and just some notes for kind of resupplying. Um, Section C, yeah, so some people are going to go into Banff, but if not, um, you can stay at Mount Engadine Lodge. That's a lodge. Um, right off trail on section c they'll also hold a resupply box for you there's a discount for great divide trail association members um there is also some accommodation in field at the um truffle pig which is kind of a like a b and b with a, a restaurant um there's a pretty limited post office in field um so you can mail a resupply box to yourself in field um, using flex delivery there's a really good there's some information about this on the resupply link on the great divide page, great divide trail association page um most hikers are going to be going to lake louise um and staying at the hostel there and their post office is right next door and there's a grocery store um so uh, they know hikers are coming in they'll hold boxes for you at the post office in lake louise or um, more people now are going to Golden, it seems like. It's a bit further of a hitchhike. It's probably 45 minutes rather than like 20 minutes. Um, but in Golden, you're going to have multiple gear shops, um, more places to stay. With all of these, though, I would book them super early. Um, Lake Louise, in particular, is full all summer long. So as soon as you know your dates, book them. Um, it's a hosteling, international hostel. So they have free cancellations. So book when you think you're going to be there. Um, also this past year after COVID, um, you can also get lunch and snacks at Sunshine Ski Resort. You're going to be hiking right through there. Um, and also if you're going to be coming through Section C a little later in the year, being August 1st, um, Egypt Lake Campground is closed. They close it every year, August 1st. Um, and the last thing, um, Kelly actually sent this to me a couple weeks ago. There's a new bus system, as far as I know, called Rider Express, and they do, uh, shuttles between Calgary and then uh, or Vancouver and they also stop in Banff Lake Louise Field and Golden so if you're trying to maybe just do a section or you're stopping at section C or you want to get back into Banff for some reason uh, riderexpress.ca does offer those shuttles Nick asks uh, detour to see the nub on um, Assiniboine would you recommend that side trip 
I've heard, I haven't done it. I've heard it's absolutely spectacular. The really hard spot is that Assiniboine is really, really hard to get reservations in. So most people aren't, most people are going to skip. So uh, Magog Lake is the big spot in Assiniboine. That's probably one of the most famous campgrounds in BC. Um, it's really hard to get those sites. It's four month rolling um, for those sites. So most people are going to stay at Lake Og or Porcupine, which is a little bit past. Um, it's probably 10 or 15K past Magog and there's no reservations for Porcupine. Um, <clears throat> So most people just don't have the time to uh, take side trips during these sections. Most people are on through section C just because reservations are hard to get. Most people are kind of powering through just so they can kind of stick to their itinerary. But if you can make it happen, you should definitely do it. Yeah, yeah. if, if you can get two nights at, at Lake Magog, I, I definitely recommend it. It's a spectacular area and there's a lot of uh, like little little trips that you can, uh, that you can take uh, in there. But uh, as Austin said, it it is like when when because they with the rolling window, like they open every morning that where you can book, and it's like it's gone within seconds. So it's uh, yeah, you know, another another vote for Snurp here. Yeah, yeah, literally seconds. Like the sites will be booked out in under a minute. And I'll make all these slides available so people have an idea. Um, there's also um, on the Great Divide Trail Association website there is a list of all campgrounds. Um, they're in kind of ascending order, starting in the south and moving north with distances in between each. They'll give you the number of sites um, and kind of what facilities are there and what park is there, so how you book it. Um, but yeah, so these alternatives that I have are most people, I put priority, but most people are not staying here. Most people are going to be staying in these alternative sites just because they're much easier to book. Right. Section D. So section B D uh, starts in field um, and then it ends in Saskatchewan crossing. Uh, it's right around 100K. Um, it's the shortest section um, on the GDT by a long shot. There's about 3,500 meters of gain. Um, we have a couple exceptional alternates um, on this section. Um, one is not the Glacier Lake alternate. Um, that's uh, is an alternate that you can do later in the year when the water levels are low, but you have to cross a very large river. Um, so please don't try to do this if it's June or July. Um, this is more of a September alternate. Um, also, as of this year, wild camping, uh, kind of not on designated sites, which is going to be a lot of D. Um, an ERSAC or a bear can is now required according to Parks Canada. Um, so yeah, section D, um, a lot of the time you're going to be on a floodplain, kind of one, half the trail. You're going to be either going up here on the red route. This is a really old kind of road that's been abandoned from Parks Canada. Um, so most people are taking the Kuitenok alternate, which uh, goes through the Ice Line Trail in Yoho National Park. Um, it's really beautiful. Once you're kind of on really nice trails the whole way, and then you kind of get to a ridge, and then here's a picture um, of my partner. The ridge is up here, and then you kind of come down through these big kind of boulders. We did not pick the best route. There's probably a better route out there. Um, but that's kind of some of the terrain you can imagine going through as you kind of just drop down into a valley. And then you go up. This is off trail for maybe 10K, if that. Um, and then you kind of get back onto the official GDT route. Uh, down here. But um, this whole section is probably on trail. It's just about this that's off trail, but it's very well flagged. Um, the past couple years, it's been the same flagging route. So th there's a bit of a trail beat down in there, but it's definitely not a built trail. Um, navigation wise, I'd say navigation is the bigger things are relatively simple. It's more of the micro navigation where it's like, hmm, is this the best route to pick through here? Um, there's not as big of a chance of getting like fully lost, but uh, just like, how do you pick the most efficient way to get through there? Camp Nab is a website that lets you know about national parks. Um, you were able to get Magog last year. Yeah, Camp Nab, Schnurp is another one. Um, I think they they work pretty much the same way. I haven't heard of Camp Nab before, but I'll post links to both of these little uh, cheater sites later. Um, regarding section D, oh, I just wanted to chat about the, the good alternates briefly. So Kuitnok is fantastic. 
um, Amisqui Ridge, which is pretty much right here in the middle. It's a, it's just a bit of a little high route. Um, it can be quite nice. If it's really stormy, it's probably not worth going up there. Um, when I was going through there, it was quite smoky, so we didn't we didn't head up there. Um, but that's nice. And then I also want to chat about the Cully Creek alternate. Melissa, I'll answer your question here in just a minute. So the Cully Creek alternate um, is very widely used. Here's a bit of a map on the bridge situation. So this lower orange line is the Misqui Pass alternate. Um, and then the red route is the official GDT. And the orange is the Cully Creek alternate. Um, as you can see, the Cully Creek basically just saves you some distance by not having to backtrack here. And you can just continue going up um, kind of northbound rather than backtracking southwest. Um, however, there was a very large bridge here, Blayberry Bridge number two, um, very large concrete bridge uh, that was taken out this past uh, fall or maybe August. Um, so it may not be affordable. Um, we are going to tr really try to put a bridge in in the spring, um, depending on what the spring melt looks like. Um, but as of right now, today, um, people should really try plan for the official Great Divide Trail route. Um, and if we do manage to get a bridge in, there's some politics that kind of go into play as far as what we can build and how. Um, we will let people know. This is a, another great reason to use the Far Out app because as soon as we get that bridge in, we can put a comment in the app and no matter what, you're gonna see it. Um, versus if it's on the Facebook page or Instagram or sent out in an email, it can kind of get lost. So uh, another good reason for the Far Out app. Um, also, Cairns Creek, there is a bridge. Um, we're going to reinforce it just so we make sure it lasts. Um, but uh, as of right now, there is a bridge. It's not as good as a one we would like. Um, so we're going to try to get in there in the spring and work on it. Um, if we do get a bridge in for Blayberry, highly suggest doing Cully Creek. It saves you several kilometers of just kind of like it's an old forestry road um, that you'd be walking on. Um, and Cully Creek has lots of blueberries. So it's a great alt. And Melissa asked, what would you recommend for additional navigation skills for the GDT? Any recommended courses? I think with just the nature of being outside, it's fantastic if you know how to use a compass. I think a lot of times we say, oh, bring a compass and a map. But um, if you don't know how to use them, they're not really worth much. So just kind of really knowing how to use a compass is great. Um, I mean, phones and watches are great ways to cheat now. But Having a non-electronic version is really good, um, simply from a liability standpoint. Um, most towns will have some kind of group that'll teach you to use a map and compass. Guiding companies can teach you. They're usually a one-day course. Um, even if you can't afford that, just kind of watching YouTube videos and getting to know your way, like how to pull a bearing and kind of get oriented with that is great. For navigation on the GDT, um, you know, in the past couple of years, we've done a really good job of flagging, putting trail markers in, building trail. So there's very few sections where it's complete route finding. Um, and when there, when it is completely off trail travel, the navigation, I would say, is quite simple. Um, section E, um, starting on the next page, does have some of that in the beginning, but it's it's very simple where you're in a big alpine environment and it's gonna be a huge pass. And it's like, okay, hit that pass. Um, you know, there's no trees, you're in the Alpine. So it, it's uh, it's really straightforward. Um, more often than not, it comes down to the micro navigation where it's like, okay, what's the most efficient way to get there? Rather than like, oh my God, how do I even get there? Okay, for section D um, campgrounds, um, it's almost exclusively in Yoho. Um, so if you want to take the Kuitnok alternate, um, you can do the Kuitnok alternate without booking these, but it is a massive day. Um, starting in field, you climb up a ton. I think it's 900 meters or something to Little Yoho. And then if you want to continue on the Kuitnok alternate, it's even more of a climb and then kind of down through the, the big rocks and scree before you get into the valley where you can random camp. Um, so most people are going to try to book Little Yoho or Yoho Lake. Um, 
both are really nice campgrounds. They will go relatively quickly, not like Flow Lake or Assiniboine or anything. Um, but I would definitely kind of have them. If you plan on doing this all, this should definitely be in kind of your top five sites to book, I'd say. Um, and the nice thing is that if you don't get it, um, you can either just kind of take the regular route, or if you're really feeling up for it, you can blast all the way through and get into the, the wild camping, which is still a permit. Um, you have to book it through Yoho National Park. For all these random camping permits, you have to call the office directly um, and just ask them for a random camping permit. Um, once you kind of hit this, uh, the big floodplain, like I had on my picture, a couple slides back, um, you'll be hiking through a lot of terrain like this, um, where you're kind of hugging the shoreline and then you're definitely going to have wet feet. I can't even tell you how many times you're going to cross the river. Um, usually it's just these little braided channels rather than the, the main spot, but you will cross the, some deeper water a few times. Um, and then you'll be camping out on the floodplain as well. So that's just a, a random camping site where you'll also need a, an ursac or a bear can. Um, and then kind of at the end of section D, um, you get to a kind of a really popular day site where there's a, a really pretty canyon. Um, and then it's um, just over between 10 and 20 kilometers to Saskatchewan Crossing. It's a really popular spot for people to hitchhike just because it's along the highway there. Um, really easy to hitchhike to because you're at this kind of big, big parking lot where there's all these people doing this short little little walk. Um, so you can hassle people to give you a ride to Saskatchewan Crossing. Um, when you get to Saskatchewan Crossing, um, this is the one spot that if you're going to send a resupply box, it should really be here. The store is outrageously expensive. Um, they will hold a resupply box for hikers, um, assuming you stay the night. Um, I chatted with them a couple days ago about this. They, um, I forgot to ask them how much they would charge if you aren't staying. But um, this is a spot where almost everybody is going to take a zero or at least spend one night and then they'll hold a box for you. To give you an idea on costs here, um, I paid $17 for a pack of Pop-Tarts. Um, it's crazy expensive. It would be several hundred dollars to, to resupply for the section. And the it's more aimed at being like a grocery store or camp food. They did have some dehydrated food, but this is a really important spot where you want to mail a resupply box. Um, and a large majority of hikers are going to swap, if they're on trail runners, this is where you're going to swap shoes. Um, especially going through section D, getting wet and stuff, shoes really start to de deteriorate by the end of section D. All right, section E. Did anybody have any questions on Saskatchewan Crossing or section D? Section D, as far as uh, the trail, it's quite straightforward. You can really kind of pick up the pace here a bit, I find. Um, I did it in four days, definitely could have done it in three. Once you're on the floodplain, it's pretty flat. So uh, you start to feel like a superhero about now. All right. So section E starts in Saskatchewan Crossing and ends in Jasper, Alberta. Um, if you're looking for kind of a shorter hike, I've done this a couple times. It's fantastic. Where Owen Creek is kind of the, the starting point for um, section E. And then you can hike north to Nigel Pass which is 50, about 55K. You can do this all without a reservation, or you can continue a bit further and do the Brazo loop too, but um, really spectacular hiking here. Um, picture here in the bottom left is kind of an idea on what I mean on, on navigation. So here you can really see like there's no established trail, but what you got to do is you got to go down. So there's uh, there's no real chance of getting lost really if you just can kind of figure, okay, I got to go north and I got to go down this valley. And then once you get to about tree line, there'll, there'll be more of a trail. Um, the section is about 215K with 7,900 meters of vert. Um, there has been a alternate called the six pass alternate. Um, in the past, it's been closed for, it was closed last year um, and maybe the year before. Anyway, it's going to be closed for the upcoming hiking season two for camping. So to give you an idea, you have to be a bit of a superhero to do this whole alternate in one day. Um, it's six passes. It's entirely off trail. There's not even a hint of a trail. Um, a lot of it's going to have these kind of alpine rolly lumps. I always forget the name of them, but where the ground is, Cussocks. what's that? Cussocks. <laughs> the ground is a foot higher and a foot lower every single step. And it's just kind of all over the place. So it's pretty slow moving. 
Um, I know of one person last year out of all the GDT hikers that that did this in one day, and I think they had a very, very long day. Um, I believe it's 44 K. Uh, okay. So it's, it's not a, it's not a short section to, to push through one day. Yeah. And, you know, as it, as it mentions, you're going through six passes, right? So there's a lot of up and down involved in it as well. Yeah. And the fact that it's completely off trail. Um, and it's it, a lot of it, it's kind of in, uh, you're not in fully Alpine here, like where you're just in kind of hard pack scree where you can walk relatively fast. A lot of it, you're getting down low, like into some bushes or like, um, juniper where you're going to have high stepping a bit. So, uh, if you think you can do it, go for it, but just be aware that, um, 99% of hikers are not doing this alternate anymore. Um, for reservations on section E, um, again, you'll need the Alberta public lands camping pass that you needed in some other sections, um, for Pinto Lake. I highly suggest staying at Pinto Lake. It's one of the most beautiful sites on the entire GDT. That was the picture I had at the beginning of section E of that like spectacular blue water. Um, it can be pretty warm too, and it's a pretty big site. You can have the year I did it, we actually, there was 11 GDT hikers at the site that night, which is kind of unheard of for a GDT hike. Usually it's maybe two or three others. Um, the rest of the time, so kind of after Pinto Lake, um, you're going to be getting into Jasper National Park. Um, the section that people are going to be on, it's called the, it's also a weekend or kind of half a week section called the Brazo Loop that people do. Um, so there is traffic on it and it does book up relatively quickly. The nice thing is that these reservation dates for Jasper are not the same as Banff, Lake Louise, Kootenai, Yoho, or um, Waterton. It's February 1st for Jas Jasper National Park. Um, and one thing to kind of keep in mind, so towards the end of Section E, um, there's a spot called the Moline Valley. Um, through this area, there's um, a three campsites, which is Avalanche, Mary Vaux, and Mary Schaefer. Um, and they organize these sites a little differently. Um, there's a caribou habitat in here, so they really try to decrease the amount of um, consistent people walking through. So they call them one party campgrounds. So you can go in there by yourself, or you can go in there with a group of eight, but it needs to be one party that books the campground. So uh, typically, GDT hikers, if they book this, and these are usually booked over the phone through Jasper, um, they book this and then they go on the GDT hikers page on Facebook and say, Hey, I got this site for this day. Who wants to be part of my party? And that's how most GDTers are getting through there. Um, also you might see there's, uh, been a lot of, uh, talk about the Moline Valley being really overgrown. Um, we did a lot of trail building in there. Um, thanks to Jasper for letting us in there. Um, so now what used to be quite a slog through the valley. There's about 6K of brushiness left. Um, this is a good section that if uh, you don't have pants, pants might be nice just to kind of save your legs a bit. Um, and then at the very end of section E is the Skyline Trail, which is the most popular trail in Jasper. Um, so that's Campgrounds, Evelyn Creek, Little Shovel, Snowbull, Takara, and Signal. Um, this trail is, it's probably the best trail on the entire, um, as far as how well it's maintained on the entire GDT. Um, to me, somebody told me Jupiter recently said that, um, the, um, Skyline Trail reminded him of the PCT. So the PCT through the Sierra is about the, that's the nicest the trail ever gets on the GDT. So if you, you can really fly here. So a lot of people will, because these reservations can be a bit harder to do, um, if you're camping towards the, the beginning of um, the Skyline Trail, it's definitely doable in a day for, for most through hikers. It's a long day because it's quite a few kilometers, but um, it's definitely doable just because the, the trail is not very steep. It's graded at about 10%, and uh, there's not that much gain for, for the distance on there. Just a couple other things in uh, Jasper. Um, there's a couple hostels. The Jasper Downtown Hostel hooks up GDT members. There's a, a gear shop called Wild Mountain. You also get a discount at. Um, if you're looking for a beer, the Dead Dog is kind of uh, one of my favorite bars in town. And there's an all-you-can-eat Indian buffet, which makes for an excellent stop, especially if you do the Skyline in one day. Is the bridge and browser loop still out? 
if it's still out, the browser loop might not be as busy. So I hiked, I've gotten a bit of confusion around here that when the year I hiked, it said the, there was a bridge that was out. There was no bridge that was out. Um, as far as last year, I don't know of one being out. I was under the um, impression that the bridge that was out was not on the part that GDT hikers are on. So the Brazo loop yeah. is a bit of a yeah, triangle. It's yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not on the the GDT portion. It's a bit further down. Um, but that that's that bridge is still out. I mean, people can. I've heard like you know you can kind of ford the outlet of the um, the, the the lake if it's not too high. But um, they're they're I think they're in the process of rebuilding it. So it may be finished by the end of the summer. But it it hasn't been rebuilt as of yet. Yeah, but yeah. For most GDT hikers, um, unless you're doing the browse like an alternate along there, it won't affect because it's not on the GDT. How often would you say you see other hikers? Um, so it really depends on your start date. If you start sometime between like the 27th and the 5th of July, um, I would say you'll kind of be in the bit of a bubble. The most popular start date is July 1st by a long shot. Um, and so you'll probably be in your bubble there. Um, to give you an idea, usually about a hundred people hike the trail. Um, and then as I would say about half of those people stop in Jasper just due to logistics. Um, the year, it seems like there's going to be a lot of people trying to hike the trail this year, more than um, previous years. The year I hiked the trail, there was probably, I was in a group that we just met day one in Waterton. There was somebody with a tarp and a resupply box. And I was like, they're definitely not car camping. And so I ended up hiking the trail with three, four other people. And we just met on day one. And then during, throughout the course of the trail, we probably saw eight to 10 other people and then would run into them like every day or every other day. And then there was another group I know that were, they were just behind us um, of about six people that all kind of, they met actually on the Facebook page. They didn't want to hike by themselves. So it was six people that said, hey, let's make our own group. And we bumped into them a couple times, but uh, there's a bit of trail lore, but as far as running into people, like a really busy day would be seeing like eight to 10 other GDT hikers. And I'd say like in, in the general question of, you know, number of hikers, like there's GDT hikers, but some of these, these trails are extremely popular backpacking trips or even day hikes, right? So there are some places that are pretty remote that, yeah, the only people you're likely going to see there are either fellow GDTers or, or a section hiker who's trying to do a section of the GDT. Um, others, you'll like you, you're walking by like sunshine, uh, the ski resort in the middle of summer, you know, there's going to be hundreds of tourists, uh, up there, uh, hiking. Right. So it, it can vary, vary quite a bit. If we end up in Jasper, is there transportation between Jasper and Calgary that doesn't take a detour through Edmonton? I would be really surprised if there's not. Um, there's a lot of transportation from Jasper to Banff, and then there's tons between Banff and Calgary. I don't know if there's a non-stop option, but um, Sundog is a big tour operator um, that does buses. There's a ton of transportation up in, between Jasper and Banff. Um, you might need to reconnect, but I would be very surprised if you can't find an option that doesn't go through Edmonton. Podcast that talked about the beginning of section E being ext extremely challenging. Um, yeah, they were going north to south. They were going southbound on E. Um, the hardest part of section E, I would say, is the southernmost portion. So the first day for people, Brewster, thank you. I forgot what the other one was. Um, I would say the hardest part is the first day on section E traveling northbound up the Owen Creek kind of trail. Uh, you're going along the creek there. A lot of times the trail, it can be kind of like off canter and steep kind of going up through there. Um, most people by this point are really strong, so it's not as big of an issue. The first time I stepped foot on the GDT, I just did this as a section and it kind of kicked my butt a bit. But um, once you kind of get up top, you can camp at Michelle Lakes, which is a beautiful site. No reservation needed. Um, it's pretty sensitive habitat, so please, um, and as well as everywhere, Please practice leave no trace principles. Um, but yeah, the first day of section E is quite hard. And then after that, I would say it gets quite a bit easier. Um, you're a bit more in an alpine environment for half of it where 
you won't be on like a, a trail you could necessarily run on compared to like skyline but um that day i would say is a harder day on the gdt but uh certainly not the hardest if weather's bad like if it's raining that section of trail i could see being you know get start getting muddy and slippery probably will be too much fun i mean uh i i did it last summer as well and it was uh yeah, it was it was a challenge in nice conditions just to to get to that section, but, uh, hmm. and I could see coming down there's some fairly steep sections that you kind of have to navigate along the uh, green. Yeah, I think going south on section E would be uh, just that one day would that'd be a rough little little hill to go down. Um, and yeah, for transportation, Brewster does Jasper um to lake louise to saskatchewan river crossing to lake louise to bamp to calgary so brewster is your tour operator all right sections f and g i kind of lumped them together because uh most people are doing them as one push here's a map of f and g so starting in jasper um national park in the town there and then ending at kakwa lake provincial park it's about 267k um with about 7200 meters of elevation gain this is all looped together there are um, a handful of alternates um personally i haven't done any of them um fng is very remote very wild um the entire time i was out there we were out there for 11 days i ran into two other groups that were going southbound but besides that i didn't see anybody um and that was one one big push there's not really a lot of um people out here for day hikes because it's quite remote, um, especially with Berg Lake being closed, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so almost exclusively anybody out here is going to be a GDT hiker. Um, FNG also has the has quite a few river crossings, um, three or four in particular. Um, on YouTube, we have a, a video on kind of some safety tips for crossing rivers, how to read them. Um, this section, I would, um, if you can, I would definitely do it with another person. The, the rivers can swell drastically overnight um, from rain. Um, it's always best to cross in the morning. To give you an idea, a couple of the spots, I'm six feet tall, and some of them were hitting me at like mid-thigh. So uh, that's about as deep as I can manage to cross anything deeper than that. And I'm going to be going for a little swim. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. And also, it's uh, very remote. There's uh, very few places to kind of bail out in F and G. Once you're in there, you're kind of in there for a bit. There's a few spots, but in general, you um, exit routes might be like a couple days rather than uh, finding a spot to leave every day. Um, so F and G right in the middle was the Berg Lake Trail um, in Mount Robson Provincial Park. There was a big flood there a couple years ago, so um, the trail will be closed this year. So you will not be able to travel down to Mount Robson to resupply. Um, also, this resupply really only saved you about two two, two days because it's a uh, F is relatively short. Um, a better option is going to be resupplying through Robson Backcountry Adventures, which is on the next slide. Um, at the end of section G, <clears throat> you um, so you get to Kakwa Lake Cabin, and that's the end of the GDT. You are very far from done at this point. From there, it's about 25K hike to the trailhead or the trail that would get you up to the cabin. And then from there, it's about another 75 or 80K along a forest service road. Um, the forest service road is in much better shape now. Um, we'll have an update in the spring on this um, from the operator up there that lives in McBride, which is the closest town to Cockwell Lake. Um, also, there's a new exit route, which can go east out of Cockwell Lake. Um, a couple people have done it. Um, if you want to be heading up towards that way. However, most people are going to be going the, the normal way. Um, and if you do end up needing to walk the road out, um, add about 100K to that distance I gave you. So rather than it being about 270K, if you're walking all the way to the highway, it's going to be up about 370K. But there is an option um, to either get picked up or resupply in the middle. Regarding some permits, Permits are pretty easy on sections F and G, which is nice. Um, by this point, some uh, sometimes people will stay in Jasper a couple extra days. It's by far the best town day. Um, these are the sites. Um, I've never heard of them being booked out. I mean, I would definitely still jump on them February 1st. But if your plans change or you get behind, it's pretty easy to uh, 
negotiate here uh, by calling the parks office. Um, and then again, so for the Mayette Valley, um, call the visitor center for your random camping permit. You'll need your public lands camping pass and uh, Mount Robson is closed. So for, I'm just gonna jump back a slide here. On section G, we have, oh shoot, I should have put it on this map. Anyway, there's Blueberry Lake, um, which is right around the middle of section G. Um, it's right after you come down the Jack Pine Pass. Um, Blueberry Lake is here. Um, you can get a resupply to this spot now, which is new. Um, there's a couple different options. So you can have them bring up your resupply box all the way to the uh, Blueberry Lake, which does involve some hiking for them. So they charge you quite a bit more and because they can't leave it. So they have to coordinate with you a specific day and time. Otherwise, there is a bear locker we had installed here. There's a combo code. Um, so they will drive up a resupply box here. Usually the operator drops in backcountry adventures. They're going weekly. Um, and so they're bringing up multiple boxes. Um, and so then they'll drop your box off. It might be in that bin for up to a week, maybe a day. But um, usually people will either arrange the time ahead of time or in reach them and say, hey, I'm leaving Jasper now, please bring it up. Um, <clears throat> there's a 50 pound limit on this. Um, most people use like wine boxes or really good boxes. It's about the right size for a resupply. Um, one thing I will note is that if you're going down to the Blueberry Lake Trailhead, there is quite a bit of elevation loss. So it's not at the lake, it's at the trailhead for the lake um, for this resupply. So there's quite a bit of elevation loss to get down there, um, which, you should take into account. I should know, I'll update the website so we have a specific distance, but I believe it's somewhere around 500 meters elevation loss or 600 to get down. Um, so it's a it's a chunk if you're going down and then back up. So take that into account for your days. Um, again, a huge reason to become a member just because of resupply discounts and you'd save a ton of money just becoming a GDTA member. So it's 129 bucks if you're not a member or 99 for GDT members. Um, also, uh, Robson Backcountry Adventures will pick you up um, on the Walker Creek Forest Service Road, which is the Forest Service Road at the end of the trail. Um, to give you an idea, when he says he'll pick you up at kilometer 52, which is how far he could go this year, that means he's 52K from the highway. Um, the Forest Service Road is about 75K, so there's still another 25-ish um, to the Kakwa Trailhead, and then there's 25 from the Kakwa Trailhead to Kakwa Lake. So there's still about 50K between when you finish the GDT and where you can get picked up. Um, another spot people have been camping if you choose to not do this, um, there is a campground at kilometer 37 which would be about 63K um, from the Cockwell Lake cabin. There's a good spot to camp there. He's also picked up people there. Um, and he can take you to either just the highway, if you want to hitch or arrange a ride there. Um, he'll also um, take you to Jasper. He can take you to Prince George, where there's an airport. Um, and the fees are on his website. Um, this is on the access page of the Great Divide Trail Association website. For doing a through hike, if you click on access, it'll uh, give the Robson Backcountry Adventure website. The fees you see are the cost per vehicle. Um, he can drive four people, I think five in a pinch, um, but the price does look steep, but it's quite remote. You need a four by vehicle to get out there um, and it's quite a bit of time. But if you're splitting it between four people, the, it doesn't seem quite as expensive. All right, let's get to some questions. Have wildfires caused closures of the GDT route in years past? Yes. In 2017, there was a humongous fire through Waterton Park. Um, a very, very large portion of the park was closed. It reopened for 2021. I think the year I hiked was the first year people could go through there. Uh, it's been reopened. Um, the past few years, um, since 2021, there's been no section of the trail that's been closed for wildfires. Um, as far as I know, and I 
pretty sure I would know if there was a section that was closed. But um, there's wildfires. We, yeah, we've had, I think, a couple of good years, knock on wood, mm -hmm. um, that while there have been some summers, it's been pretty smoky on the trail. Um, there, there's been no fires that have directly uh, impacted the trail. Um, I know a few years, I think maybe 2018, they had some closures in uh, Kootenai National Park along the Rockwall Trail. Uh, they had some some big fires that, although the the trail itself wasn't affected, um, they they closed that whole section because there was a uh, firefighting crews and you know they were like staging out of sunshine a ski resort and and uh, to kind of keep the fire under control. Um, so it is it is something to definitely be aware of that it you know, and if we we have a dry winter kind of like what we're having right now, it it may be a, a bad fire season this year or this year. Mm -hmm. Most people wear trail shoes or hiking boots. Um, I'll talk a lot about this in the gear webinar in February, but um, uh, boots are more common in Canada than in the States for sure. Um, but I would say it's uh, a majority of people are wearing trail runners, um, like certainly over 50%. Um, and then with most people swapping the pair of shoes, um, it's Saskatchewan Crossing or Lake Louise. Can you take the trail from North Boundary and do a side trip to Berg Lake? Um, or is that part closed too? Um, it's technically closed. Um, I know people have been cheating it. Please don't do that. But um, everything in, everything on the Berg Lake Trail is closed, um, no matter how you're getting there, um, whether you're coming from North Boundary or going up from, uh, from the base there. Brewster has now been renamed for Pursuit. So for the shuttle from uh, Jasper to Calgary, it's now called Pursuit. And just one other thing I want to mention is, you know, the, the GDT, our relationship with parks is so important on making this happen. Um, parks could make this way more difficult and really kind of just put a whole stop to hiking the trail. Um, so please do your best to, you know, I know the reservations are kind of a pain in the butt, but uh, do your best. If you're going to have to change it, call parks. They can, everybody that works there is lovely. They're eager to help people. They want to get people out there hiking. But, um, you know, if people are getting caught not doing, not abiding by their reservations, it really makes the organization look bad. And it really is going to go in the way of like several years of effort. A lot of all volunteers are putting towards uh, making this relationship work. Do you know if a Jeep could truck the, <clears throat> the entirety of Walker Creek? Um, the person that does the pickups, they were in a like lifted four by truck. Um, they were going to 52K. Um, you could probably make it. Um, the year I hiked, we were in a lifted truck also. Um, you can't love the paint job on your vehicle. We were like brush bashing a, several kilometers. And for a large chunk of that, we were going 10K an hour. So it was quite slow. Um, we'll know better on what the... the the Walker Creek FSR is going to look like in the spring when somebody goes up there, but um, they could get you uh, at least quite close. Um, but come probably May, we'll have a much better idea on what that looks like. Yeah, I know before there was like a bridge that was out or basically was mostly out so that it wasn't really able to carry anything of any weight. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was one of the bridges that is, was uh, kind of rebuilt by uh, by Cam for this summer. So, that, that, like I said, I think. After the snow melts, that will have a better idea of just uh, what condition that road is going to be in. Yeah, the, the road might become active this year as well. So anybody traveling there should probably have a have a radio too. Can you bury your human waste or are you required to carry it out? Uh, you can bury it. Um, please just the poop though. Um, please pack your toilet paper out. There's, um, I mean, a majority of the spots are going to have a throne or, a, or an outhouse, but um, probably I'd say 10 or 15 if you're doing a through hike, 10 or 15 of the nights, uh, you'll be in a section where you're going to have to bury it. Also a great reason to get a bidet because then you can save a ton of weight on toilet paper. All right. And any other questions on uh, sections F or G? Okie dokie. Oh, and one thing I wanted to mention um, regarding webinars coming up, if anybody has any dire questions, um, two nights before the reservations go live for um, Banff Kootenai Yoho, 
We're going to be doing a members only kind of ask me anything um, webinar also. We'll have it more as a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar so people can kind of ask questions. But if you're if you're really stuck on an itinerary saying, hey, I don't know what to do here, don't know what to do here. Um, membership is really important to us, so we really want to reward those that are members. Um, you can definitely ask these questions on the Facebook Hikers page, but if you want to chat with some people at the GDTA on, on how to mitigate some reservations or really whatever, we're going to have kind of an ask me anything two nights before uh, the reservations go live. All right, and passing it on to Kelly now on how to book some uh, some sites, particularly in Parks Canada. So Kelly, if you want to do a bit of an intro and then take it from here. Oh, Kelly, you're on mute. Try that again, thanks. Uh, Kelly McDonald, is, so I'm more of a, a section hiker on the trail. Uh, while I was all lined up to uh, to through hike the whole trail in uh, 2020, I unfortunately had a, I had a medical issue and had to get off trail fairly early. But uh, since then I've been checking off section after section. So I've got about uh, about a third of the trail uh, under my belt and I'm, I'm hoping to get that up to uh, to close to half of that trail uh, this year. Um, so I am a member of, of course, the GDTA and I serve on a couple of uh, committees, uh, particularly the IT committee. Uh, so as a uh, organization continues to grow, uh, where, you know, you know, as you see the, the website, there's a lot of content on that. Uh, so managing the website and, and all the tools we use for for membership and, and signing things up. Um, as well as I'm heavily involved in what we call our TPA or tail or trail protection and advocacy uh, committee. And this is an important committee where we we work to kind of build those relationships with all of the the land managers up and down the trail um, and and working to get kind of formal recognition of the trail. So we, we've got some good progress, particularly on the the Alberta side. So the parts that are responsible, not necessarily within uh, like Banff or, or Jasper, which are our federal lands, uh, but getting more and more formal recognition of the trail route on the Alberta side and, and getting a, agreements in place for you know, us to be designated the formal manager of the, those trails. Uh, similar on the BC side, working with BC parks, as well as BC uh, rec, uh, trails and rec sites um, that, that manage a lot of the, um, you know, responsible for a lot of the sections of the trail on the BC side. So this is an important, uh, you know, responsibility the, the the more that we make our make friends and uh and build those agreements the the stronger the trail is going to be and uh, and this is also like where we're we're trying to work on that kind of end-to-end -end permit uh which i know would would definitely make life a lot easier um but as i mentioned earlier it is it is a a complex nut to crack and it, it, it'll probably be you know, a few years uh, you know, before we have something like that in place um None of the land managers have said no, so that's that's good, um, but they haven't said yes uh, as of yet. So what I'm going to do is, is kind of, you know, change the uh, um, and, and kind of go through the actual reservation system. So there's a couple of systems. Uh, the, B, the one used by BC Parks uh, and Parks Canada is actually the same kind of system under the covers, so it's going to look fairly similar. Um, so I'll kind of go through those and, and kind of how you would use those to make your reservations. I'll also show you the uh, Alberta Parks uh, reservation site, which is a little bit different. Um, and then you've you've probably seen in a few places where there's the, uh, at least on the Alberta side, the the Crown Land Camping Pass. I'll show you where you can get that. Um, and then there's also, and this is more of a, a a specific use case. There's what's called the Kananaskis Conservation Pass, um, and that's only for people who are parking their vehicles. In, in certain parts of Alberta. So in, for when it comes to the GDT, um, there are some sections around like Peter Lawhe Provincial Park, um, a little bit north of that. I'll, I'll show I'll show folks a map. But if you intend to park a vehicle there, uh, you need that pass. If you're just hiking through, you don't need the conservation pass. If someone's dropping you off or picking you up, you don't need that conservation pass. But I'll at least show you uh, where to order it. So if you're more Doing a section hike, uh, that may be uh, something that you need to look at. Okay, so I'm just gonna. Are you uh, able to? Oh, there we go. There you go. So I'll start off with uh, with Parks uh, Canada because that's where the the vast majority of permits are. You're going to be uh, booking, and of course, this is the one that comes up uh, first uh, at the end of the month. So if you go to like just search like Parks Canada reservation, you'll actually kind of come to this landing page. 
uh, where they talked about all the different you know, reservation launch dates for all the different parks across the, uh, across Canada. Of course, the ones we're most interested are in Alberta, where you've got Banff, um, and they'll talk about both the front country. So these are all the front, front country campsites that can be booked, and those open on February 26th. Um, and then we've also got um, the backcountry camping, which is on January 29th. So this will just, if you want to look at the dates of you know, when things are open um, and when booking starts, uh, this is kind of that central clearinghouse. Hey, Kelly. Now, in you... order. Sorry? Can you share your screen? Oh, am I? I thought I had it shared. Oh, it's saying that it's uh, been disabled. Oh, I'll let you. One sec. There you go. Okay. So, as I was saying, can folks uh, see this now? This is the, uh, if you do a search for just Parks Canada reservations, uh, you can kind of see the uh, the URL here. Um, I'll just quickly drop that uh, into the chat so folks have it. I'll, I'll drop it in just at the end so it don't take too much time. But as you can see, if you look at each of the provinces will have their little breakdown of the different parks and when those reservations open. So you can see for front country camping in ja or in Banff, it's uh, January 26th, 8 a.m. Mountain time. So it's important that it is most of these bookings, for the ones that we're going to be worried about are mountain time and they open at 8 a.m. Um, on those dates. For backcountry camping in Banff, Kootenai and Yoho, um, January 29th at uh, 8 a.m. So if you want to just refresh yourself on okay, what dates, when do I need to set the reminder in my calendar to, to be online? Uh, this is kind of where you'll start and it'll give you the links to the actual reservation uh, system itself. So on the Canadian or Parks Canada side, when you click on it, um, on the day of, and I'll, you'll see this when I, I show you the, the Alberta site, is what Parks Canada does is they open a queue starting at 7.30 a.m. in the morning. Um, so you can, you know, you know, don't like set your timer for eight o'clock to try to get in. But at 7:30, you can log in, you can connect to the the reservation system, and it'll it'll put you in a queue, and it'll tell you like you're waiting for the you know, the next you know 25 minutes, 24 minutes, 23 minutes, counting down until eight o'clock, and then at eight o'clock, it basically randomizes all the people that are in the queue, so it doesn't matter. If you join that queue at 7:30 or 7:45 or 7:50, um, as long as you get in that queue before eight o'clock, it'll then, like I said, randomize everyone, and then it'll assign you uh, basically a, a number within that queue. So Austin had mentioned having you know three or four devices set up logged in because what will happen is eight o'clock is you know, each of those devices will get a number in the queue, and one of them may be. 10,000, so the 10,000th person in that queue, one of your, your other devices may be 800. So, you know, when that happens, you'll be like, okay, I'm closing my, uh, the one that had 10,000, and I'm going to just sit on my, uh, my device that has 800 in the queue, because that's the one that's going to be served the fastest. Um, one thing that you can do, and I recommend that people do in advance, is you want to make sure that you have an account set up. Uh, already with the, the Parks Canada system. So if you click, see up here, they've got the sign in option, uh, click sign in. And because this is a you know a federal government website, they have a couple of methods that you can use. It's not just a, a separate account specifically for this, but it's either through what's called GC or Government Canada Key or a partnership that they have with uh, Canadian banks. So you click on that and it'll give you kind of two options. So if you are like you know Canadian, uh, you live in Canada, and you have you know a bank account with any of these providers, you can actually click on this button and using your your banking credentials, like your 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 debit card and password for online banking, um, you can basically sign in with those credentials. Um, you'll usually get a like it'll ask you for a you know a, you know. You know, that you approve to allow Parks Canada to provide access, um, but then that allow you to authenticate and then you can kind of create your account from there. Um, if you don't want to use this option with your bank account or you're, you're not a Canadian citizen or you don't have a Canadian bank account, 
Um, you'll want to go through this GC key option where you can say, you know, sign in or create an account with GC key. Um, click on that. And then you can either sign in if you have one, or you can say sign up. Um, click on sign up. And then it'll kind of walk you through the process of, you know, entering your information, your username, password, a uh, few, um, few questions and answers and an email. And then it'll, it'll actually create the account for you uh, that you can use with the, the reservation service. So I'd recommend if you don't already have an account with Parks Canada, um, I do this in the next week and make sure it's all set up and working because um, you don't want to be scrambling with this on the day of uh, during booking. Um, the terms and conditions for the GC key, like I said, you, you don't have to live in Canada, so this would be the approach that I'd recommend if you're uh, if you're not in Canada. Okay, once you've once you've gotten in and you're uh, logged in and you're at the, the Parks Canada reservation system, what you'll see is there's a couple options. So they'll have front country camping accommodations, backcountry, and day use. So, you know, the only place that you would generally use this kind of front country uh, camping option is you can pick, for example, um, in uh, Waterton Lakes, um, it'll give you the option of actually booking a spot at the, the main campground uh, in Waterton. Um, some folks that are staying in Jasper uh, may choose to actually stay at one of the the Jasper Front Country Campgrounds. There's, I think it's, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of um, the campground, Whistler. but there's one, Whistler, I think, or, or something like that. Yeah, so there's there's a couple of uh, fairly large Front Country campsites or campgrounds that are pretty close to the Jasper Town site as well. Um, and then if you're also planning to stay in, in Lake Louise or Banff, um, you know, you can also stay at the Front Country campgrounds there. For here, you just pick whichever park you're looking for, you know, arrival, departure date, um, what your equipment is, you know, click search and it'll give you, um, you know, the variety of different options. Um, so in this case, you know, there's no restrictions to, uh, you know, because it's the middle of winter, but this is kind of where you would pick whichever campground. So like Whistler's, for example, um, and then it'll give you the option to, you know, pick individual sites which are available and uh, you can then add that uh, to your, um, your shopping cart. Uh, for checking out. For for backcountry camping, it it's a similar process, um, but what you'll see is that there's backcountry campsite, backcountry zone, and the West Coast Trail. So what you'll end up checking here is if you look at, um, you'll want to pick the backcountry zone, and it'll give you the option of either Banff, Kootenai, and Yoho backcountry, or Jasper. So you pick Banff, Yoho, um, you know, and uh, Kootenai backcountry. Again, pick the, so this is the first day of your itinerary. Um, so, you know, maybe you know, July 31st, party size, number of tent pads, and then you'll want to select an access point. So for most people that are doing a through hike of the GDT, you'll want to pick the Palliser Pass access point. Um, this is kind of the southernmost. One of the things that, you know, historically that we've recommended people do is because Flow Lake is so popular, you know, some people will just go in and, and book the rock wall section of the trail right away um, so that they can get that locked down and then worry about kind of the less popular uh, parts of the trail um, subsequent. So if you want to do that, you would then instead of picking Palliser, you would pick the Flow Lake trailhead. And then this will allow you to start kind of building your itinerary from there. One thing that we've we've worked with Parks Canada and they they put a request in to make a change. It hasn't it hasn't been confirmed whether they're going to be able to do it or not. But historically, you haven't been able to kind of book an itinerary between Ball Pass, the campsite, and Flow Lake because of the distance involved. So it's about 20k, and for like an average backpacker most people would not be doing, you know, hiking from Ball Pass to Flow Lake. So the system itself wouldn't let you pick that itinerary. Uh, we're hoping that change is going to be made so that it's going to at least pop up a warning that you can then say, yeah, I'm fine with that and book those sites. But for now, like I said, many people will click on Flow Lake and then kind of 
book the rock wall sites. And then if you need to book, book a ball pass, um, you would then pick the Hawk Creek trailhead. And then you can kind of pick, you can get ball, um, ball Creek from there. But if you're starting the trail at the south, that is like where you first enter the park. That is the, um, where it is, the Palliser access point. You pick your day and then you start building your stay. And then you'll start kind of looking at what are some of the available sites. So actually, let's do it. So there we go. And so you can see here's the Palliser Pass access point. And then we can start going along here and say, okay, well, I want to stay at uh, Burstall. So I can click on that. Um, and it'll give you some details on the uh, Burstall campsite. And then say, yep, I want to add that to my stay. At this point, it basically won't let me because um, it won't become available till the end of January. But you can see right away, like they'll they'll have the little legend here where it's like, if it's a green diamond, that means it's it's available. Um, if it's red, that means it's it's currently full. Um, so some people like to use kind of this little graphic where they can say, okay, I'm going to click bird, Birdwood, add that to my stay, and then maybe they're going to stay at Marvel Lake, add that to my stay. Um, what will happen is then you'll also get to like, okay, well, after Marvel Lake, I'm, my next night is going to be in a Cinnaboyne. It's like, well, that's not within Parks Canada. So what I can do is I can say, well, I'm going to pick a day, which is out of the park for one day, add that to my itinerary. And then the next day, maybe I'll be at Howard Douglas Lake. Pick that, add that to my, my your itinerary. So you can actually build your itinerary all the way Here's Sunshine, here's Healy Creek, here's Egypt Lake, here's Ball Pass, um, and then just kind of continue to build that itinerary. Uh, like I said, this section here between Ball Pass and Flow Lake, right now it won't let you pick Flow Lake as the next one in the chain, but we're hoping that they're going to put in a change to allow you to do that. Um, otherwise, you need to book these as kind of two segments, um, and then you'll have your, your itinerary. Any kind of questions on, like, this is how you would book everything within Banff, Kootenai, and, uh, and Yoho. Kelly, there's a question. Um, when you're assigned a number in the queue, can you book all your sites in one go, or do you only get one campsite per ticket? Yeah, good question. So for Banff, Kootenai, and Yoho, that the Parks Canada basically treats that all from a backcountry perspective as one park, right? So you can book you can you know book all three uh parks um within that that's, that's kind of single um you know number that you got in the queue and i believe that you can add up to five different um basically itineraries within your your shopping cart and once you kind of once you click this add to stay and it's in your itinerary you've got it it's it's you know you've got i think like 20 minutes to complete it but it basically holds that site for you as long as it's in your uh, little itinerary list that you've built up. And so you can keep going and then maybe you, like if they don't make that change, maybe you build the first itinerary up to Ball Pass and then you can click reserve and put that into your shopping cart. Okay, then you can keep going and say, okay, I need to build my itinerary from, you know, through Rock Wall, um, you know, out through Helmet Falls and up through, up to Field. And then you add that to your cart. And then you look at, okay, well, I want to do the Equitinac alternate. So I'm going to be going up here, uh, up the kind of Burgess Pass. Here's Yoho Lake. So I, maybe I want to add that or Little Yoho. And then here's over Equitinac Pass. And then where it kind of then rejoins the, the GDT. So you can add those three different kind of little sections of, of your trip. And uh, you know, once they're in your, your shopping cart, uh, once they're all done, you can just uh, basically look at what's in your cart. Uh, check out and it'll add you some information and payment details and, and so on. I think it's important to note that um, when you hit reserve, then it's in your cart. Just by building yeah. out an itinerary, it doesn't mean you get dibs on it yet. You have to actually click the reserve button. Um, and I, I'd say in, in while in past years, there there have been issues with instability, right? So sometimes you're like, oh yeah, I got my perfect itinerary. I go to pay and it spins and it spins and then it crashes and it's gone. 
Um, thankfully, I think like last year, I heard a lot fewer cases of that happening. They've de they did some upgrades last year. Um, they've made some improvements. So there's not nearly as much frustration as there has been in previous years where people have just, you know, they lucked in, they got what they wanted, they hit pay and then things blew up and it was bad to start all over again. Um, that's unfortunate, but like I said, it's gotten a lot better in recent years. So hopefully it'll be even better uh, this year. Um, one thing is I'll, I'll just, oops, um, Kelly, before you start, there's a question about, yeah. can you build your, your plan and then do it? Um, or do you have to do it all live on day? You have to do it live. So the, before they introduced that kind of queuing system, you could basically create your whole itinerary. And then the moment that the clock ticked over to eight o'clock, hit reserve and bang would be in your, um, uh, in your, uh, your shopping cart. Um, so that's, that's how a lot of people would do it, um, prior to that. Um, but now based on this kind of queue where you're basically lined up and as soon as your number comes up, um, you basically have to start building the itinerary right there. And then, mm -hmm. and, and with some of those sites that were in the slideshow, I'll send those out. Um, I find most people, uh, are going to book those high profile sites first um and then fill in the fill in the rest um, yeah so that would mean like for example flow lake if you want to stay there pick your access point as flow lake because it's the closest yeah. trailhead to that to that area and then you can go back and, and, these days yeah and so one thing i would recommend is like if you're kind of unfamiliar with the system like you can log like i said you can log in today and you can start kind of playing around and say oh okay well these are the different campsites and Oh, okay. This is going to be the next one in my itinerary, or you know, what is the closest trailhead so I can pick the one that I want? Um, like, you won't be able to book anything, but at least you can familiarize yourself with what the system looks like. Um, just uh, the question here: If you have to start over, do you need to get a new spot in the queue? Um, unfortunately, if your instance kind of crashes, you you do need to start over. So. What I encourage is that if you have a couple of devices that you use to log in, um, you know, definitely you want to pick the one that has the lowest number. Um, you may want to keep the computer that has the second lowest number just to the side, just in case. So if something does happen, you're not all the way back to square one. Um, but yeah, basically, once you lose that, um, it you got, you have to start over again, unfortunately. I will also just add, this is another great reason to get the far out app because looking here, you can't see elevation. And so if you do get kind of, it's good to kind of familiar, familiarize yourself with where these things are, what park they're in, um, how to book them. But then with the far out app too, you can look at the elevation profile to get like, okay, well, if we need to push and is pushing an extra 15 K to a different site feasible, or is there a 1200 meter climb that we have to do? Um, one thing that's a little bit different, so I'll just quickly show Jasper, um, is that Jasper doesn't really have, like, in BAMP, you can pick, like, there's a whole bunch of trailheads, and then, you know, from there, you can kind of build all these itineraries. Um, Jasper almost, like, divides the park into kind of different zones. So if I say, okay, I'm coming in from um, then, um, Cataract Pass. Nigel would be the furthest south. Yeah, I'm just trying to see. Oh, there we go. So if I pick like Nigel Pass and then I click search, it's going to kind of, you'll see kind of like the same um, kind of like map, but it's only going to give me the option for campsites that are kind of in the Brazo loop area. So I can pick kind of all my Brazo loop items. And this one does give you a bit of a itinerary or um, elevation profile, at least for kind of the Brazo loop. So I can say, okay, well, I'm going to pick, you know, four point, and then I'm going to pick, you know, Jonas cut off, you know, waterfall and so on and so forth. Um, but as you can see, well, okay, I can't keep going up the trail for kind of the next section. So unfortunately, the way that this works is okay. Once I've added all this, I reserve, add it to my, uh, um, add to my shopping cart. And then I have to look at kind of like the next one, which is, um, uh, Yeah, Patogan, I believe. Pick here. And then, okay, now I've got a slightly. Um, oh, oh, 
sorry, Malgene Pass. I pick that, and okay, now I've got, you know, the next kind of set of, of campsites up the trail. And then after, you know, uh, Malgene Pass, I then have to look at uh, Malgene Lake Trailhead, which is where you start the skyline. And then you can pick all your elements for skyline. So it's it's a little bit less convenient in that you've got to you know do it a couple of times to get all the Jasper permits. Um, but like I said, the easiest way would be to um, spend some time playing around and familiarizing yourself before the end of the month, um, because like I said, there's a lot of little kind of nuances, and you basically want to be able to say, okay, I got to click this and here, and and basically figure out exactly like what sites you're picking and what screens they're on. Um, so the question here for if you book your flow like night, put it in the cart and go back and piece the nights before and after. Yeah, you can um, you can do that, and that's what a lot of people will do. They'll just throw flow lake in as a single night uh, on the trail, hit reserve. So it's like okay, I've got it right, and then they can start putting together the the other items that come after that and come before that. Um, and then same if you encounter any mileage limits, is you just create a separate itinerary in the cart. Uh, if it's not going to allow you to do that, so you can kind of just split it up, and you may have four or five like bits and pieces um, in order to get that uh, that that together. So just a few other things. So there's like kind of this map view, which is great to kind of give you a uh, okay, where are all the campsites in relation to one another? Um, sometimes if you're if like these sites are starting to go quickly because people are booking them or, or adding them to their itineraries, another view you can look at is this ca calendar view. Um, and so what that'll do is, okay, here are all the campsites kind of within that area, and it'll give you a view, okay, what does the availability look like over the next few days? So, you know, you might get into a situation where it's like, oh, you know, darn, like I, I didn't get Flow Lake the night that I wanted, but, oh, it's available tomorrow. So I'll grab Flow Lake tomorrow, and then maybe, okay, I'll have to slightly update my itinerary, and maybe I'll stay an extra night at Egypt Lake or... You know, maybe I'll stay an extra night at Porcupine in uh, in Assiniboine <clears throat> just to kind of extend my my itinerary so that it's like, okay, I'm now going to get to Flow Lake a day later than than I originally uh, expected. And this kind of works well if you're if you need to assemble uh, an itinerary of like, okay, I need you know Evelyn Creek on the third, and then Curator on or Takero, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on the sixth. It this also works uh, really well for assembling those. <laughs> okay, so that's the um, kind of Parks Canada. The next one I'm just going to quickly show you is the um, BC Parks. I think I can close that. So. So BC Parks, you can see like the site is very, very similar. <coughs> Again, you'll want to create a account in advance. Under signing, you can just click at create an account. This one, you don't have to kind of go through that GC key like Parks Canada does, um, but you just create an account, set that up, and then you can start making your, your backcountry reservations. <coughs> now, there's kind of two ways that where this will come in, in handy. So one and the most important one is for backcountry reservations under parks, you'll have Mount Assiniboine. You know, put your dates in, click search, and then you're going to be like, you know, on the day of, and, and this is different because BC Parks does a basically a four month rolling window. So every day, the next, you know, the next day will become available in the summer and then the next day and then the next day. So it's a case of if you, you know, if you don't get it today, you can try again tomorrow. But, you know, the two little spots here at Magog Lake campground where there's again, little green diamond and Og Lake, those are like often these will book up in, in literally seconds uh, once they open up. So, um, you know, they'll be kind of a similar, you know, you may be, um, reloading and and one thing that I, I would recommend to folks is that because there is like a, like a timer that like once you put something in your kind of your queue it starts a clock of I believe it's either five or ten minutes of that it can kind of sit in your your queue and if you don't book it then it it releases itself so I've I've actually had some good success where you're like 
okay, like I'm looking at the calendar view and okay, I'm going to refresh and I'm going to refresh because the one that was showing as Magog Lake is being booked on the 15th was because someone just put it in their queue and then, oh, actually they, they, they really wanted, um, you know, or maybe they, they didn't get Magog Lake. So they quickly picked Og Lake, someone else canceled. And so they like, okay, I got Magog Lake and then Og Lake expires. So if you do, if you see right away and you log in and they're both red, don't give up immediately reload and, and maybe spend a good 10 or 15 minutes just refreshing the screen because sometimes you'll see these kind of pop up as either people decide that they they don't want to complete the transaction or they change their mind or what have you um it, it does pop up um but these are the only two sites that you need to actually book and reserve in a cinnaboyne as mentioned there is a campground at porcupine which is a little bit further down which is first come first serve no reservations um while Magog Lake and Og Lake are beautiful places to stay. I mean, Magog Lake a little bit more so than Og Lake. They are really nice campgrounds. Um, Porcupine is you know, isn't as nice, but again, if you have that flex, if it, you have there is that flexibility. It's not quite as um, you know critical as you know Flow Lake and Ball Pass because that's a bit of a bottleneck. Um, you can just say, you know, if I didn't get Magog Lake, I can hike a little bit further out to Porcupine and, and stay there without any concerns. There's also a few other uh, campgrounds that are in Assiniboine that are a little bit out of the way, but um, you know, there's you know, you can check out the the provincial park website. Um, but these are the only two that require reservations. Um, one other thing that you notice that there are a couple of campgrounds that are kind of first come first serve, but there is a fee that's involved. So there's Akamina, um, just kind of off the Parkway in Waterton, which is actually on the BC side, where it's you know, it's five dollars if you want to stay there. Um, same with Elk Lakes. You can um, just there's a little kiosk there. You can like drop your five bucks in or or what have you, uh, and and self register at the site. Or if you want in advance, you can actually say, okay, I can in, or I want to pick uh, Elk Lakes, um, and it'll basically you're not really you're not booking the campground. You just say, okay, I want to pay my five bucks. Add that, and then you can um, like it's not open right now, but you can kind of pay your your five dollar permit in advance if you'd like. Um, like I said, there's no requirement to do this because you can pay at the at the location. But some people just like to know, okay, I've got my my permit and it's it's all taken care of, and I don't have to worry about you know carrying you know cash with me or you know on the trail for that. Any questions about kind of BC? So the next one is I'll show you um, uh, Alberta parks and you're going to see uh, and I, uh, the reason that I kind of did it this way is you're going to see for a second kind of what you can expect to experience with this kind of queuing because Alberta parks kind of runs this all the time. So when I click on Alberta parks, oh, maybe it's not going to let me queue in. Oh, and it looks like they actually might be down. Oh, there we go. So this is kind of this queue it type thing that you'll see. You'll get this. You know, timing right now, it's like, well, there's no one else waiting. So it says it's now my turn and our estimated wait time is less than a minute. If this were on the you know, kind of the parks Canada, the 29th, you would say, you know, you're 843 in line and it'll, it's going to take 20 minutes or so. Um, yes. Yeah, so for the uh, national park random camping. So these, you do have to call into the. Um, the trails office, either in Banff or Jasper or Waterton. Well, Waterton doesn't do random camping, but in either Jasper or Banff, uh, in order to get those random camping permits. Now, if you, you know, ideally you want to try to get these kind of on the open, like as soon as you can. It is hard to get them on opening day because they are slammed because most people are through the website, but other people are trying to call in. Uh, to the contact center to book their camping, you know, through you know, by talking to someone. Um, so generally, they're really busy. You'll they'll usually let you leave a uh, like a recorded message, and they'll try to get back to you in order to give you the random uh, random camping permits. For the most part, especially like in like Northern Jasper or like the House floodplain, it's there. There's not a lot of demand, so it's 
like I said, you want to get them, you know, as early as you can. Um, but generally, you know, there's, there's not a lot of trouble getting those where there was a challenge is, um, historically when they did that, like section in the Malign Valley, where there was like that group, uh, like where they only allow one group to camp, there would be a little bit of like people kind of, you know, hurrying to try to get that group so that they would have that particular date. Um, Right now, yeah, if you actually saw when I was on the, the Jasper site, the Malign Valley is one of the regions that you can pick. So you can actually book that online. Um, but again, like before they did that, there was a little bit of um, uh, like kind of a scramble because there was that only that one group. Uh, same for when they allowed camping on the six pass alternate is that they only allowed one party to camp any night. So if you were the first person that got in, great. If not, you were you were kind of out of luck, um, but yeah. So yeah, call in if you can. Call in that, that day. Leave a message, um, and then when they get back to you, you can kind of get them locked in as as quickly as you can. One thing I'll add is that if you're doing the random camping for Banff, Kootenai, Yoho, um, Lake Louise is also included. Lake Louise is call the Lake Louise office. They get way less calls because they don't really have that much camping, but they because they're still part of the same infrastructure, they can book it for you. Um, also with messages, um, they do call people back in the order that they get voicemails. I know it sounds like that's not a real thing, but it was, I got a call back surprisingly quickly. Um, but yeah, and I would just skip, don't call Banff, Kootenai or Yoho, just call Lake Louise cause they can book it for you and they'll answer the phone way faster. Um, for Alberta, as you can see, it's a little bit, um, um, so this is so Albert has done on a 90 day booking window. And again, depending on what it is, if you want to book, like, for example, Bolton Creek, which is the front country campground that you arrive at, like, just as you get off of sec, like the, the end of section B start of section C, you would go, okay, I want a campsite. I'm going to, you know, this is going to be, you know, Bolt, Bolton Creek. Um, and then I'll pick, you know, my, you know, arrival and departure date. Uh, maybe I want to do some, I, I mean, it's not open in the winter, but, uh, I click search. And then it's going to come up with, okay, here's Bolton Creek. Bolton Creek isn't open in the winter. So of course, all of these are marked red, but then I can say, okay, like I want to book these particular sites. So, um, we're kind of talking about like, what are some of like the RV sites versus the, uh, the tent sites. Um, I suspect. You know, Austin, when you said you kept having to walk up and down the hill, you were in a loop over here. Um, and there's kind of, this is like the, the, um, right here is where the store is. So you'd basically be walking up or walking up. I think there's a, there's a pretty good hill right here as you kind of walk up and then go to your loop. Um, you can kind of also grab spots in this loop. I think this is the, the E loop is kind of their, um. Yeah, E loop. To be honest, these aren't the nicest campsites. They basically they took, uh, they basically shoehorned a lot of RV sites into here. But these do have power, right? So if you want to have something that's close to the the Bolton store um, and place where you can plug in and recharge, these are kind of the the nice spots to uh, to book, um, just so that they're they're close and convenient. And then you can see, like when we mentioned that there's showers, there's like a, a little um, kind of you know hygiene station up here where you can get uh, some tokens from the store. Um, and then go have a shower if you'd like. Um, so yeah, you can pick like, yeah, I'd like, um, like no service power, power, water, sewer. I mean, if you're tenting, you probably don't need sewer or water, but, uh, power is definitely a nice uh, benefit. Um, and then you just, of course it won't let you right now, but if I could, I could just pick a site. Um, and then it'll give me some details. I can even look at some photos as to what it's going to look like. Um. When it's available, you get a little button here that says, yep, add it to my uh, cart. And it's basically the same, same process. You add it to your cart. Uh, once you're logged in, then you can just, you know, um, buy whatever's in your cart and, uh, and proceed. Um, similar, you'll want to, um, kind of sign in and make an account in, in, in advance. Um, and, uh, you, that's uh, normally at the other top of the screen. Oh, there we go. Show this banner. So I can click on sign up in order to uh, create an account with uh, Alberta parks because of the way that this kind of works. It's a little bit separate. So you would go in, you know, book your front country if you needed it. Um, if Bolton is, is full, there is also lower lake. Um, 
campground, which is just kind of across the highway. Um, so it's kind of a backup. Um, another place that some uh, GDTers will also stay is a little bit further down. Um, it's called uh, Mount Surreal. I'll just uh, see if I can do this right. Back it out to uh, Peter Lahu Provincial Park. Sorry, it doesn't seem to be coming up, but there is a basically a, a tent only campground in uh, Peter Lahi Provincial Park called Mount Sorrel, Um, and it's located right here. It may be, it actually may not be showing up because it's not a, it's only for, come for a serve. So it's not kind of bookable in advance. Um, but there, there is like a, like I said, a little kind of tent only campground uh, that's available right here. And, and some GDTers will kind of use that because it is, if you can't get your spot at Bolton or your, your, your itinerary is kind of off. Um, hopefully you can stay first come first serve. Um, I'd say generally can ask us on weekends. It's extremely busy. I mean, it's a very popular camping area for, for families. Um, during the week, it's, you're usually able to find a spot. So it's, it's, it's not too, too bad. Um, what I'll show you then is just kind of the, the back country. So this is, there's only a couple sites you really need to worry about here. And that's, you know, when you, so for example, if you come off of section C, you know, right about uh, here, and then you hike, um, you know, around uh, Upper Kananaskis Lake. So there's, if you're on the main trail, there's campsites at, this is Point, so it's a little bit off trail, but it's nice campground right on the lake. Uh, there's Forks, which is located right here. And then there's um, Turbine Creek uh, camp, campground. And so this is kind of the, the official GDT would be this route over the North Kananaskis Pass. Uh, but if you're taking the uh, north over alternate, you would go actually kind of around the south side of Kananaskis, and then you'd want to stay here at uh, Astor Lake backcountry, and then you kind of hike over um, north over ridge, and north over ridge is basically right along the uh, the border between the two provinces, um, and then you come down to Three Isle Lake, and then over South Kananaskis Pass. But you know, similar, you basically say, oh, I want to stay at Turbine Canyon backcountry. Um, you don't really pick a specific site uh, for backcountry camping. You just say, I want permit A, B, C, or D. So there's, you know, basically in this case, 12 sites at, uh, at Turbine Creek. It'll show you green, you click the button. Um, and if you want to look at availability, again, you can see, well, when is it available? So I, maybe I want it for the 22nd. Of course, right now, Turbine Canyon is, is closed because it's the middle of winter. Um, but basically you pick your dates. Um, maybe just to show you how this works, I'll actually pick uh, point because point is actually uh, um, so yeah, I can just say for point, I want to pick um, you know this particular permit. I'm gonna say you know it's one adult or or what have you, um, and then add to cart. It'll give you a little bit of details on the campground. Um, and right now, I'm, you, you know, you'd be signed in, add the information, make payment, and then you get your permit. And that's basically you just print it out, and you've got your permit for for the backcountry sites. Um, for national park grand backcoming permits, is it one permit for the entire season, or is it by park? It is by night. So the way that it works in the in the provincial in the national parks is while you don't need a like specific reservation for a location. You will still need to say, okay, I am planning to stay on house, you know, river, you know, the house floodplain on the night of the 27th. And so they will give you a permit for house floodplain on the night of the 27th. Um, so they, they do kind of manage, they, they kind of need to, they basically they want to manage usage for different areas of the park. Um, some areas, they actually have limits to say, you know what, there's only five people that can stay in this part of Banff any night. So that's kind of why they they use that to kind of control uh, usage for certain parts of the uh, park. But yeah, it is it is specific. In a moment, I'll show you the 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 um, Crown Land Camping Pass for Alberta, which is you buy it and that's that's all you need to worry about. You don't need to 
say what night and where you're staying. It's uh, just a pass to to use the backcountry as you wish. Um, do you need to carry printouts of your reservations and payment? Um, that you can. I, I know a lot of folks that will just like take a screenshot and and store it on their phone. Um, so it's a light way of doing it. Lightweight way of doing it. Um, the only concern would be there is like you know if your phone's dead at the moment that you happen to bump into a you know a ranger and they want to see your permit. You know there's there's always that real risk. So you know you can print it out. If when I do print mine out, I'll either like okay I'm going to double side it. And and if you get the permit, you'll see there's like there are like five pages. The permit itself is just kind of like the the first page that has like the little barcode and says you're staying this night at this campground. And then there's like three or four pages around like backcountry regulations and you know don't have fires and you know do this and make sure your food is stored and put away. Um, that stuff you don't need. You don't need to print it out. Um, so you know if you do want to actually have a hard copy, what I'd recommend is. You know, you can like just take the one page that you need. You can shrink it down so you can actually probably get like four on a sheet of paper, double sided, so you can probably get you know eight permits on a single sheet if you need to. Um, and that way you kind of have a hard copy uh, if you'd like to to carry that with you. Um, just before we move on past yeah. the backcountry camping, I just put the Schnurp link in at the bottom. Sure. Um, so if on reservation day, you know, you're like. I really didn't get that. Um, you can go in. I just double checked. Sorry, I accidentally put the uh, the FAQ URL in there, but um, they handle BC Parks and Parks Canada. So you can go in there and say, you know, I'm looking for Magog Lake or I'm looking for Flow Lake. And you, you go on there. Um, I would do it quickly. And then basically the order in which you ask for it. If you're the third person to ask for it on that site, each person you get a, a short window, it's only a few minutes where they won't tell the next person in line that the site's free. Um, they don't reserve it for you, but they're, it's the order in which they say, hey, this site's free. You were the third person that wanted it. It's your turn to go book it now, if it's still available. And um, I'll say like, it, I find it works actually quite well. I mean, Pretty much every time that I've needed a spot that I couldn't get on the day of or, or missed out, I was eventually able to get it through through Schnurp. Sometimes it's only like three days before I was about to leave, but you know, it's it usually seems to come through um, every time I've tried to use it. And I think you know, someone mentioned that there's like what is it, uh, Nab Camp or, or that's a very similar type tool that basically just constantly scans the. Uh, the uh, the reservation website for you know that particular date and that particular site, and if it opens, it'll let you know, and you got to jump in and, and grab it because it doesn't lock it down. I mean, other people could be logging in to try to to book it, but it gives you an opportunity to do that. So I'll just um, and I know we're uh, we're we're at two and a half hours, so I'll I'll try to keep this part quick. Um, but the two other things that you might need on um, you know, during the trip is. One is the public lands camping pass. <clears throat> and so you can just do a search for Alberta public lands camping pass and these URLs, they're all on the, um, on the website under the uh, kind of the permit site that so it gives you the links to get to any of these. Um, so what you need here is you just want to say, okay, first, it'll tell you kind of where you need the particular camping pass. And this is where sometimes things can get a bit complicated because of the nature of, um, you know, parks uh, and their rules and regulations. So you can see this a kind of big blue area, which is where you need that particular, uh, where you need the, the pass. For our concern, that is, if you kind of look at the map um, and kind of zoom in, that's gonna be kind of like this section through here where it's kind of crown land and in blue. Um, so for example, if you're in the castle, so castle, castle wildland provincial park, or Castle Provincial Park. Um, so if you need to random camp in the Wildland Park, you don't need a permit. So you don't need the the camping pass for this for camping in this part of the uh, the trail. If you just hand over Willoughby Ridge and and leave Castle Wildland Provincial Park, and you're now into Livingston Public Land Use Zone, well, you need that pass, right? Um, same as you kind of hike all the way up through. This is all kind of Livingston public land use zone across the High Rock Trail and GDT. And then you get to this little place, which is the um, uh, beehive uh, natural area. Uh, because it's a natural area, you don't need the permit. You can just camp random camp there. 
Um, and then when you get into Kananaskis, you get into an area called uh, Cataract uh, Snow Use Public Use Zone. But it, because it's in Kananaskis, which is applied that, uh, that conservation pass, I'll show you in a second, you don't need that, the, the Crown Land Camping Pass. Um, and then you're good all the way up until you get to uh, um, you know, on the trail where you start getting into, um, this is the Job Klein uh, Public Land Use Zone, which is around, the so Owen Creek is in Banff itself, but once you get up over Owens Creek and uh, kind of Owens Pass, and you're in Michelle Lakes or Pinto Pinto Lakes, you're now in this Job Klein Public Land Use Zone. You need your your uh, Crown Land Camping Pass, but then you go into White Goat uh, Wilderness Area. You don't need the Crown Land Camping Pass. Um, you get into Wellmore Wilderness. You do need it, right? So again, it's I mean, for the if you're through hiking the trail, you're going to need it because you are passing through a number of these blue zones that that require that particular uh, pass. Uh, but if you're just doing like a section hike, like if you are saying I'm going to do section A, and I'm you know I'm going to go through Waterton, go through here, and then uh, I'm not going to I'm not planning to camp in this particular area. Yeah, you you wouldn't you wouldn't need it. And if you're doing like like sections of okay, I'm just going to hike you know section C uh, through Kananaskis and through Banff. You wouldn't require it, so you know this this map is kind of good to help determine. Okay, do I need it or not? Um, once you've determined that, yep, I do want to buy one. Um, click on buy your camping pass, um, and it kind of gives you the details on how it's being used and uh, you know what the the benefits are. Um, you do have to buy it through what's called Alberta R E L M. So this is kind of the the same tool that's used for managing. Hunting licensing, fishing licensing within Alberta. You do need to create an account. Um, it'll create a wilderness. Um, I'm not even sure what IN stands for, uh, but it'll, it'll create a win number for you, and then you can use that to 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 buy your Crown Land camping pass. Um, if you use the mobile app, it'll actually put the uh, that that pass on the app itself, so you don't need to carry a hard copy. Um, and then if you want to fish while you're on the trail and at least in Alberta uh, Crown land, you can get your uh, your fishing license to be able to do that as well. Um, the last thing that I'll just also mention is there's the Kananaskis uh, Conservation Pass. And again, this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is only if you are planning to park a vehicle in kind of this, the kind of like pink border, right? So this is Peter Lahey Provincial Park here. Um, if you're like, you know, going up into Cinnaboyne and kind of, you know, pat, the parking in Spray Lakes, uh, Valley Provincial Park, or, you know, you wanted to, to get off trail to go up to, to Canmore, for example. Again, if you plan to park a vehicle, you need the conservation pass. If you're just driving through, if you're hiking through, someone's dropping you off or someone's picking you up, you don't need the, uh, the pass. Um, in order to buy it, you just click, I'd like to buy my conservation pass. Um, pick whether you need a single day, multi day, or annual. You know your vehicle. It'll ask for your license plate number, um, and then um, you can kind of purchase that. Um, one thing I didn't mention is the Crown Land, the Public Lands Camping Pass, is only thirty dollars a person for an annual pass, so it's it's not particularly expensive. Um, for the Canada Ask is Conservation Pass, it. Like you can, if it's just a day, the day is not too expensive. I think it's like 15 bucks. Um, and if you want like an annual yearly pass, it's it's definitely a bit more expensive. It's 90 bucks. Um, I mean, that, that's something I have because I'm in Canada. Ask is probably every other weekend. Um, but if you just like someone you just wanted to park for a, a day, you know, it's only only 15 bucks. A uh, question, the rough estimate on cost of all the permits. I. I put this together a couple years ago when I was kind of doing my through hike. I think in the end it came out to about I think it was about four hundred dollars. Um, I know since then the the numbers have kind of gone up a little bit, so it's probably probably about five hundred bucks. I'd probably guess in that range for all the permits up and down the trail. Um, so that's it, also it is definitely something to to, to plan for it. Right? That's also including the national parks pass, which is like seventy. Um, if you're hiking with another person, it's <laughs> Not quite cut in half, but it's it's definitely less if you're yeah. if you're a group. So with that, I guess any questions um, 
any more kind of questions on the various permits and, and passes and you know, kind of the process. I mean, it is a, I mean, it is like you know, Austin mentioned, it, it is kind of a pain, right? There's a lot of moving parts and things that you need to, to pull together to do it, but it, it is so important for the kind of the future um, development of the trail. You know, the, the support of the land managers up and down the trail is, is critical to getting the formal recognition as well as getting management agreements in place that allow us to do trail maintenance and build bridges and, you know, clear blowdowns and, and build new sections of trail. Um, without the land manager support, we're basically dead in the water. We're, we're not allowed to do work on, on public land without their permission. So, you know, having that, you know, you know building that reputation that the, you know, GDT hikers are, you know, conscientious that they're following the rules that they are, um, you know, good stewards of the land, you know, is, you know, really helps the, the association with our mandate to, to make it, you know, you know, a better long-term trail that's going to last, you know, for, you know, that, that our, our children and children's children will be able to hike for, uh, for generations to come. So I know, like I said, it's, it's not ideal, a, a you know, one and done, you know, you know, permit for the whole trail would be uh, fantastic. And it is like, like we've said a couple of times, something that we are, uh, working hard to to try to 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 put in place, but um, just as you just as you saw, all the different zones and different colors, and different parks, you know, each one has their own rules. Some require permits, some don't. Some require permits, some don't. So it's it is it is a challenge to get everyone up and down the trail to all agree to something that's going to work, um, and one that's going to be kind of fair for all the other uh, users of of those parts of the uh, of the. Uh, of the province and uh, and parks. Um, so, just question uh, from Nick: uh, Is the Canassas Conservation Park needed even if you're parking at an RV site at a provincial and national park? So, the answer is is yes. So, if you're parking in, so I'll start with the national park. So, the the essential the, essentially the rule is, if you're driving through on the Trans Canada Highway, like straight through Banff, um, you know Yoho or Kootenai and you know, out the other side, you don't need a discovery pass. If you're planning to like, you know, go do a day hike and, and park in the park, or you need to go into Banff to grab lunch, then you need to have a discovery. You need to actually have a, a park pass um, uh, for the park. Now, if you're just there for a day, you can get the day pass and it's, it's not that expensive. But if you're hiking through um, and, or you're spending more than a couple of days, then you definitely want to look at getting like the the annual discovery pass. The the other nice thing about the the the, the discovery pass for the national parks is that it's it's valid across the country. It's valid in every single uh, national park. So even if you're like you know say you're from Ontario or you're from Bank or from BC and you're doing you know the trail, um, you know it's still valid if you're going to go to a national park uh, elsewhere in the country for the the rest of the calendar year. So it is. It's you know if you're you're going to national parks fairly often, it's a good thing to to have regardless. Um, when it comes to the the Kananaskis Conservation Pass, that is if you are you know parking at an RV site. So I guess if you're tenting in an RV site in like for example Bolton Creek, you don't need the conservation pass. Basically, they they drive a vehicle through with cameras on it and they look for license plates. Um, so if there is no license plate at your your campsite, you don't need the conservation pass uh, in uh, the provincial parks in Kananaskis. But Kananaskis is quite a small area. It's a very yeah. It's 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 pretty like for the GDT, it's pretty much just the um, just basically Peter Lougheed Provincial Park. Right? Excellent comment. Uh, Nathalie about Discovery Pass. It is it, um, Search and Rescue in Parks Canada uh, is free because people have um, these passes. Yeah. And, and I, I'd probably just add to the comment is that in general, like Search and Rescue up and down the Great Divide Trail is like if if you do need to get rescued, they unless it's like flagrant, you know, that you you've been incredibly stupid and you've you know done something that you know. Basically, ninety nine point nine nine percent of the cases, there there's no charge. They're not going to you know bill you. About the only thing that you might incur if you were to get injured on the trail and and had to get evacuated is that 
you know, maybe the helicopter comes in, picks you up, and then drops you off, and then you get into an actual, you know, physical ambulance that drives you to the hospital. Is you may get charged for that ambulance, but not for the the helicopter coming out to uh, to pick you up, um, unless, like I said, like they 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 do have some discretion that if you've been, like I said, it's you know you know flagrantly you know doing something really like you were. You know, I I don't even know what example that would make sense, um, but yeah, there will. They will take care of that. Yeah, and the answer is even if you're not a Canadian citizen, yep, their their focus is to get you out of there uh, and uh, and and have people safely get off the trail. So, um, I just want to tie in again. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. There might be a couple more questions to come in. Huge thanks for Kelly. You did a great job explaining the park system way better than I could. For everybody on the call, um, again, I just want to. I just put the link in the chat. Um, membership is super important for the organization. You know, uh, we don't have a National Parks Act, so we don't get a ton of money directly from the government just for existing. All of our funding comes from donations. It comes from grants that we're applying for. We're volunteer-based. Membership is a huge way to support us, especially in kind of the things that we want to do. So please consider becoming a member. It's super helpful for us as, as an organization. And I think like even even if you're just looking to uh to, you know to buy a a durst tent, right? You know whether you're planning to hike the trail or not, like you can uh, you can easily pay for your uh, your membership just by uh, by doing that. So big time, yeah. Or a quilt from Gear Trade, or yep, backpack, yep. a tent. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. Did you have anything else, Kelly? No, just uh, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, for those of you looking to hike, hike the trail, hopefully this has been informative and hasn't scared you away too much because it is a incredible experience. I mean, while I haven't uh, through hiked it, I have hiked a lot of the of some pretty spectacular uh, sections that I'm going to treasure those memories for the, the rest of my life. So it is an incredible experience. And uh, if you're looking to uh, to embark on it, it's it's well worth it. And if you do, all success to your your trip. And of course, be safe and and have fun. Great. And uh, I'll see everybody. We'll have some more webinars coming up here. We'll send out some info regarding that. And uh, tomorrow, I'll post this slideshow for people to be able to download themselves. They'll have my notes in the bottom too. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven questions that I could not get to. I'll have answers for all of them by Sunday at the latest. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good night and happy trails. Happy trails.